this meeting uh, today for 5.30, and you can see that our clock doesn't work, but I'm showing that it's actually 5.31, so I'd like to begin. Um, and first, I want to thank everyone for coming, for being here today. Um, I want to thank the mayor, who is also present, for helping us to pull together his staff. Um, Donna Laskaya and folks who may hear from the DPW. And I want to thank uh, Jim Nash, who's also here in his capacity as the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, which is a subcommittee of sort of, it's not really a subcommittee of the city council, but it's one which is chaired and um, uh, well staffed. Uh, and, and attended by people from many departments across the city. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you all f folks know that we are recording. This is audio and video recorded by the mechanism we have back there by George. And um, I briefly tell you what the you know what we're trying to do. We know everybody is under time constraints, and this is a difficult time of the day. But what, we, uh, what seems to be the best uh, way to approach this meeting is to, um, for me to first be able to introduce Donna Lascalia, who is the DPW chief from Northampton. I'll also um, ask uh, mayor, uh, the mayor if he has anything more. Okay, just so you know that he's also in attendance, which is really great to know. And that what Donna will be doing is first I know we may have the agenda, but it's a, it's a little screwed up. There'll, there'll be first an explanation of the process whereby this particular intersection became included into the MassDOT project, and a description of what that whole, this is uh, what we're talking about is the MassDOT, it's not a city project, but a MassDOT project, and there are specific guidelines and requirements related to that, which Donna will also go on to explain. Um, She'll be able to also turn it over then to the project engineer who does not work for the city but works for an engineering firm, Foster O'Neill. Um, Donna will be able to explain that and uh, how he is uh, involved in this. And then after we've done that, and I expect that that'll take the least amount of time, that those presentations at immediate, end, because I know people are eager to ask their questions and provide their comments. And those will be able to record with the help of uh, Laura Kutzler, who is the um, assistant to the city council. Uh, thank you for. This is not a usual meeting. Again, it's not something. Again, you'll see on the agenda we have a, a roll call. This is not a regular meeting that we have. It's one that I just called to be able to address the particular concerns I heard from constituents around this matter. So, I think what I will do at this point, it's okay, is introduce to you our uh, DPW chief, Donna Lascalia, uh, and I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. My name is Donna Lascalia. I'm the director of the Department of Public Works, and I'm joined here by Nick LaPointe from Foss and O'Neill, and also Rika Kulapara from Foss and O'Neill. They're both engineers, but, uh, and just a very brief or, or minor correction to what's on the agenda, item four. Um, Fuss and O'Neill is contracted through the city for this project. So Fuss and O'Neill is an engineering design firm working for the city for this project. So they are not working for MassDOT, they are working on behalf of the city. Um, so it has been asked of me by Councillor Carney that I provide uh, an explanation of how it came to pass that a traffic signal is proposed for the intersection of State and Finn Streets. Um, so what I need to do in order to get to that point is we, we kind of need to turn the clock back a little bit um, to 2003 and, and just go back through history and I will be very, very brief because um, I know um, people don't necessarily um, have a lot of time at this time of day. Um, but I do want to make sure that everybody understands how we got to where we are. And then what I'm going to ask Nick and Rekha to do is provide the data behind the decision-making 
in this process. Um, so all of this started in 2003, and the project was initially put forth as a cooperative effort between DPW and planning, and a consultant was hired to conduct a study primarily focused on the area between the bike path and the North Summer Street intersection. <coughs> the idea was to reinforce the entry to downtown um, through streetscape. I mean, this was a very 100,000 foot level project. You know, what can we do to make the entrance to the city look great? And so time went by, and in 2010, um, the city contracted with Buss and O'Neill to develop a conceptual design to, again, improve the same intersection, north and summer. And a public meeting was held. Um, and at that time, that was really the extent of the project. It was just kind of a focus on the congestion in this area of King Street. Um, and, and it was fairly limited at that time. Um, but as a result of conversation with Buss and O'Neill again in 2010, it was determined that, you know what, maybe the project limits actually need to be expanded a little bit here to look at multiple intersections within this corridor. And this is very typical. Anytime we engage in any sort of engineering project, you know, we, we start at 100,000 feet, and then as you start to zoom in, you say, well, we need to look at this detail, we need to look at that detail. So there's a process and there's time that goes by, um, and, and then you sort of end up in a place where the project might be getting a little bigger than was initially anticipated. So in 2011, the planning department contracted Nelson Nygaard to provide concept designs and recommendations for transportation improvements along the King and Main Street corridors. There is a three-day public uh, design charrette, which is basically just a, a, like focus groups and public meetings, and there's a lot of design and public input that happens in a very short time period. And as a result of these efforts, in 2013, the then director of the DPW submitted a project need form to MassDOT seeking to place this project on the TIP. So what is the TIP? It's the Transportation Improvement Program. It's a combination of federal and state funds that, that fund improvements to local roadways. Um, and, and it is administered by MassDOT. So projects funded through the TIP need to follow MassDOT process and they need to adhere to particular design and construction standards that are set forth by MassDOT. Um, on August 16, 2013, MassDOT notified the city that the project review committee had evaluated the project and assigned it an official project number, 607502, and that makes it official, and that means that it's on the tip. So this happened in 2013. Um, it was noted at that time that the project included improvements to King at Finn Street, which was a documented high crash location. And again, Nick is going to talk to the, the data around this in a minute. So at the request of the then DPW director, this was my predecessor in 2015, Fuss and O'Neill submitted a proposal for engineering services around this project. And it, again, at the request of the DPW, the proposal included traffic counts on King, Summer, North, Finn, and State Streets, as well as turning movement counts at the State Summer, State Finn, King, Summer, North, and King, Finn intersections. The inclusion of the state fin intersection was due to the years-long process that I just described and a, a recognition that there are safety and traffic flow issues at this intersection. So again, years, years of study and design and public input have gone into this, and at this point that we're now into the design process, it's, it's a responsible move for the city to ask the consultant to please look at every intersection that's feeding into King Street at this point. Because if you don't address you know, every potential bottleneck or, or every potential place where there is traffic queuing, you know, the overall project isn't going to be as successful as it could be. So in 2016, after the traffic counts and the turning movements were conducted, or the turning movement counts were conducted, um, a preliminary design meeting was held with Foss and O'Neill planning and the DPW staff. Um, this meeting did include a discussion of the state fin intersection. And again, I'm going to let Nick speak to the specifics around this intersection. But the result of the turning movement data and the traffic queuing data that was collected was that the state fin signal proposal was added to the pre-25% design. So it was found that it warranted some sort of traffic control at this intersection, again, after all of this data had been collected. So in 2017, a full set of 25% design documents were submitted to MassDOT in accordance with their standards and their process. 
Um, and it, we had to provide justification through Bus and O'Neill for everything that was in those 25% design plans. So there were subsequent conversations over the next 12 months between Fuss and O'Neill, DPW, and planning where we looked at all the pieces of this project. So again, very common in any engineering project that we do. You know, as you really start to zoom in and look at the specifics of it, there are internal conversations that go on between the city and the city's consultant about what is in the best interest of public safety or how to best upgrade public infrastructure to do this with any project we engage in, you know, a sewer line, a water line, a storm water line, whatever it is, this is how we get to a place where we are able to present what the design is going to be. So, on March 16, 2018, MassDOP recommended scheduling what's called a 25% design public hearing, which was advertised in accordance with the law and held on September 25, 2018. There were about 40 people in attendance at this hearing. Uh, there were no concerns at that time voiced about this proposed signal. So, what is a, a MassDOT 25% design hearing. What, what is the purpose of this? Um, the, the purpose is that it provides an opportunity for the Commonwealth to furnish information to the public um, concerning state construction projects uh, and to afford an opportunity for residents to speak about what their comments or their concerns might be. And it, it, it also creates an opportunity for the Commonwealth to understand what those comments and concerns might be. So it's sort of like a, a two-way information, two-way conversation for folks. Um, the, the information that's garnered through that public process is then taken by city officials, it's taken by state officials, and it is used to make the best possible decisions around how a construction project is going to proceed. So it's, it, it's very clear that public input is welcome, public input is necessary, public input is important. Um, and, and it is all taken under advisement. Um, so what I will also say is that as a, as a result of 25% hearings that have gone on for other large projects within the city, Con Street is an example, based on feedback at that 25% hearing, um, there were originally two slip lanes going, uh, going into the Con Street roundabout. And as a result of public comment through that process, um, it, it went down to one, one lane. Um, Damon Road, out of the Lamon Bridge Road, through the intersection to the railroad tracks. This was based on public and city feedback regarding traffic queuing on Bridge Road. And this was after the 25% design public hearing. Uh, the North King Roundabout, so these are, these are all kind of mass DOT projects. Um, th th we actually um, <coughs> requested uh, an analysis of a signalized intersection um, at North King and Hatfield Street instead of a roundabout. And, and an analysis was done on that, but no change was made. So it's important to note that based on comments, based on feedback, we can move in a different direction it, are, it, are the comments already followed? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but they're certainly taken under advisement. Um, so, you know, in it, 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 this case, I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that I'm here to explain process, which I think was a big question about how did this happen, and this is an informational meeting to explain that. The, the comment period around this project is closed, for Mass DOT, you know, written and verbal comments were submitted as part of the design public hearing, and then there was a deadline after that to have them submitted, and I believe that that, that comments were received um, by Mass DOT or, or given by many of by many, many in the audience or, or the counselors in attendance here. Um, you know, the projects on the tip are a really excellent opportunity for the city to leverage federal monies. And the, the projects are dynamic enough that we can look at all sorts of alternatives during this process. But ultimately, this is a great opportunity for the city to take the money that is available to us and to make some really significant public safety upgrades, 
and also upgrades which address long-standing traffic congestion and traffic queuing issues. And, and that is what our intention is here. This is a $3.3 million project um, that is scheduled for 2021. So this is a big deal. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, and and I, I, I want to make it clear to everyone that a lot of thought goes into this. You know, this has been years in the making and the decisions we make <coughs> We, we make based on data. We don't make them rashly. We don't make them impulsively. We, we make them based on long-standing conditions um, in a particular place and the improvements that we need to improve that particular place. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Nick for a more detailed description sure. of this particular intersection and the data behind it. Thanks, Don. That was that was a really good background and kind of stole a little bit of the thunder, and so I can kind of bypass some of these slides, uh, as you'll see. Um, my name is Nick LaPointe. I am with the consulting firm Fuss and O'Neill. Um, I am the project manager for this project. I'm a registered uh, professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts. Um, with me is Rekha Kolapara. She's one of the many project engineers. Um, as Don was kind of saying, this is a large project, so there's a lot of people involved, um, especially in the city and, of course, in the consulting end. Um, also with us is Eric Bernard, he's our office manager. Um, we are located in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, that's where this project is being designed out of. Um, we're a consulting firm of about 350 employees uh, in all, throughout New England. Um, so our office uh, has about 30 employees and um, primarily transportation and traffic uh, as well as civil engineering and other disciplines as well. Um, so that's kind of a background of, of Fuss and O'Neill. Um, so we are here for you. We work for the city, as Donna was saying. Um, and so the most important part of this whole thing is, is, is us as engineers, you know, we can crunch a lot of numbers and we can look at a lot of data, but um, some of the everyday uh, issues or concerns you might have, um, you know, this is the time for you to express those. So uh, this meeting is, is really important to us to gather your feedback and, and we're here for you. This is not, uh, um, we're, we're really here to gather your feedback. So thank you for coming out um, and look forward to hearing your questions. So just a quick, uh, for those of you who are, aren't familiar with the project limits, um, I know it might be a little hard to see here, um, but basically the, the, the King Street Quarter project, this Masco T tip project, starts at the Northampton Bikeway Crossing um, and continues southerly um, to Bright Street, so just past Dunkin' Donuts, um, and addresses a lot of concerns along that corridor. Um, that's, the, that's the primary, uh, the primary goal is to improve uh, congestion um, and pedestrian and bicycle safety along the King Street corridor. And so, Donna gave a really good background of the project and kind of the process of how we got here. Um, and she talked about that, you know, that thousand foot view. Um, and at that one thousand foot view, we kind of developed a theme. How, how do we look at this project? You know, is this a, a rural highway? Is this a urban uh, local street um, and, and kind of understanding what King Street is and what this project is helps us better uh, define kind of an approach. Um, and so what we did is we really wanted to take a complete streets approach. Um, and I wrote transportation equity up there, you know, making sure that we not only think about vehicles, but pedestrians, bicycles, um, public transit. Um, this is a very important corridor. So not just serving uh, of vehicles. Obviously, there's connections to downtown, um, pedestrian safety. There, there's people walking to school um, down North Street. So <coughs> it's it's very important that we take a complete streets approach um, and and take ch and take chances and risks in terms of uh, complete streets. People um, oftentimes think of, of King Street as a commercial corridor, um, but what is the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? And so. In that thousand foot view, this is kind of what, what our goals were, it was the up to date pedestrian and bicycle uh, accommodations throughout the corridor, reduce peak hour uh, congestion, uh, improve safety for all users, um, extend the urban context. I talked about kind of bringing downtown up King Street, that's a really important part of this process and was looked at in, a, in multiple studies. So we really want to uh, try to include some streetscape enhancements and uh, sustainable uh, stormwater practices as well. Um, and then there's the infrastructure side, replacing obsolete traffic equipment, um, improve the pavement condition, so you know new asphalt, new sidewalks, um, and then obviously the landscaping as well. And so to get into kind of the, the focus of the state and Finn intersection, um, 
and kind of what the background is and, and, and what goes into uh, warranting a signal. We call them signal warrants. Um, and so just if you aren't familiar, you probably are, uh, this is for, for a street that has such a residential type character, it has, a, it has very high traffic volumes for, for the, the functional classification that is State Street. Um, 8,000 vehicles per day, that was measured in 2015. That, that's, a, that's quite a bit of traffic for a, for a residential street. Um, Finn Street, 9,600 vehicles. Um, in terms of the Pioneer Valley in the region, the, these are, uh, these are, those are pretty significant volumes. Um, and 219 cyclists were counted um, just in one day on Finn Street. That's also a, a number that's, uh, you know, that, that's a very uh, larger than average, uh, just looking at other communities around that we'd see. Um, so what, what are kind of the, the problems with uh, State and Finn Street? Um, accident history. Um, there is, there is a, a trend of, of crashes in the past. Uh, we look at a three-year period, and I'll, and I'll describe that in a second. Um, that, that's a concern we have here. Also, uh, Donna mentioned the, the long vehicle queuing. Obviously, the queue can extend uh, 600 feet plus on State Street. So as part of this TIP process, some of the money that's leveraged is called CMAC, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality. And the goal is to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. And, and Mass DOT requires us to look at vehicle queuing and idling. Um, and a goal is to reduce the amount of, of dwelling time a vehicle sits in, in a queue, and reduce those queues to be eligible for this special federal funding. So that, that's, a, that's a, big, uh, a big deal as part of this intersection, and something we're going to try to, try to address. Um, pedestrian safety. Um, there actually was one note, there was a pedestrian vehicle accident noted within the study period. Um, so that's something we also look at as part of this intersection. Um, obviously, with it being unsignalized right now, um, the pedestrians enter, enter the roadway um, within the crosswalk without any, any protection. Um, so looking at ways we can increase pedestrian safety. And then there's uh, also ADA compliance. Um, recently, DPW, I think in the past couple of years, replaced the, uh, the sidewalks and, and warning panels out there, so that's a step in the right direction. However, it still does not meet current uh, state standards for uh, accessible pedestrian uh, accommodations um, within a, a city-owned uh, right-of-way. So what brings us to, to have a signal here? Um, one measure that we look at is called level of service. Um, and level of service is kind of the industry standard of, of looking at how, what, what the delay is at that intersection. Um, it's, a, it's a scale from A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, with F, a level of service of F being a delay greater than 50 seconds at an unsignalized intersection, um, where at that point, um, People, people feel like, oh, there's a, this signal or this, this intersection, uh, there's a lot of traffic. That, that's, you know, that's what we say. When you start to get towards that uh, E and F category, the perception, you start to really feel, hey, there's, some, there's something not right here. Um, and so this is the methodology that, that's industry standard um, and accepted. And this is what Mass DOT requires us to use, uh, the, this scale of grading the intersection. Um, and it is like a report card. You get a letter grade, A, B, C, or D. It's, Pretty straightforward, and there's um, certain factors that go into how you how you get this grade. It's uh, uh, delay, and we look at we have different traveling traffic modeling software um, with vehicle inputs and the number of vehicles that that kind of give us this uh, this grade. And so we look how we look at what grade we're going to receive is we look at the build condition. So the, uh, what we're going to be doing in 20 years. Now, MassDOT requires a 20-year investment. They do not want to invest their funds in a project that isn't viable for a 20-year period. So we grow the traffic volumes at this intersection 20 years into the future. And we compare our proposed project with if we did nothing in 20 years, uh, what would those traffic conditions be like? So we compare apples to apples. We're not comparing, oh, what's the traffic like today versus what is it going to be like in 20 years with a new project? Um, that wouldn't be a, a fair comparison. So we, 
we compare these uh, these build conditions, um, and that's part of the, also the mass of the T standard um, guidelines of, of analyzing these intersections. So just to cut to the chase, is basically right right now, 2018, this intersection operates at a level of service F. Now in 2035, it's going to be a really bad F. Um, so just to give you a sense, now. We also look at different peak hours, so the morning commute, the evening commute, those are typically the periods we look at um, for analysis. We do not, unless it's a special condition like a shopping plaza or um, a hospital where, the, where there might be different hours of, of higher traffic. Um, typically on in city, in city and town intersection, you look at the uh, from 7 to 9 to 4.30 to 6.30 or 3.30 to 5.30, depending on the certain site constraint or the context of the intersection. So the vehicle queue spoke about before is also reduced from 665 feet to 142 feet on State Street. So comparing these two, you know, level of service F to a level of service B, uh, that's a significant improvement, and so when we look at different alternatives, uh, Mass DOT likes to see at least a minimum of a C overall as an intersection, and so we're achieving a B, which is a, a significant improvement over existing conditions. And this is just one measure that we look at um, to warrant a signal is is improvement in that level of service. So we check that box. The next box we look at. Um, for signal warrant is the accident history. <clears throat> now, this isn't the highest accident uh, prone intersection in the city by any means, but it's still notable. Uh, 11 accidents from 2012 to 2015. Um, we look at a three year period, uh, and this is the most recent available data that we have, um, is 2012 to 2015, or when the, we initially analyzed it was 2012 to 2015. Um, and I noted that there was that one pedestrian accident, um, which was certainly concerning. We don't like to see any at all, we like to see zero. And any time there's a single pedestrian accident, usually it goes right on the state's radar uh, or city's radar. Um, that, that is not the kind of uh, accidents we like to see. Um, and multiple accidents um, involve personal injury. Um, typically, uh, you know, we get the fender benders. Those are property damage only. Anytime we see personal injury uh, accidents that are coded by the police department, those are usually red flags as well. And so what MassDOT makes us do is actually uh, prepare special diagrams to look at the exact nature of these crashes. Um, and at this particular intersection, a lot of them are angled collisions, um, which shows, which can usually lead us to many conclusions. One being is that at an unsignalized intersection when you have a stop control is that people are usually trying to sneak out into traffic and they're getting T-boned. Um, that, that's usually an indicator uh, of an angle of collision of, of why that's happening is looking for a gap in traffic. And so in order to kind of gauge uh, is 11 accidents bad, what does that mean uh, comparatively? So we develop a rate, an accident rate, and um, we compare that to a statewide average and their accident rate for this intersection was 0.67. Um, and that 0.67 is per million vehicles entering the intersection um, per year. So per 1 million vehicles, you will have 0.67 accidents. That's basically what that means. Um, and the statewide, I'm sorry, the, the District 2 average, which basically is the Pioneer Valley, for unsignalized intersections is 0.62. So it's slightly above um, the district average. So not a terrible number. Typically when we get over a crash rate of one, there's additional funding and usually there's uh, significant traffic and safety concerns at, at that point when you get over a crash rate of one. Um, but nonetheless, a 0.67 is higher than the state average and it costs us to look at this. So um, that was that was one, one thing that kind of said, hey, we, we better, take more look at uh, state and fin as, is there something we can do here to, to decrease that crash rate? The final uh, checkbox we really need to, to look at is the actual signal warrant itself. Um, now there's nine signal warrants that you could potentially meet. You only need to meet one of them. 
And these signal warrants are a federal highway, so the federal highway developed these signal warrants. Um, and these are what's uh, recommended, or at least you need to meet these to justify a signal installation. There is a, another warrant that's engineering judgment. That's the final warrant that's really not listed. So we could meet all nine of these warrants. And the final recommendation is an engineer could still say, it's not the right, it's not the right installation for a signal here. So it doesn't, these warrants do not relieve the professional engineer of and the city and other duly appointed officials of making that recommendation of putting a signal in. However, the signal warrants are typically what we use to fall back on in terms of looking at data and warranting a signal or, or saying, hey, we need to put a signal here, this, and this is why. Now, in this case, we meet two of the nine warrants. And to note, warrant number one, which is the eight-hour vehicle volume, that is the, the best, I don't like to say the word best, um, that is the, the warrant that is the most justifiable for a signal installation. Typically warrant number one or warrant number seven usually is, is the reason why you'll see a traffic signal installed at an intersection. Is there's either a lot of crashes and there's a problem um, or there's a lot of volume and delay. And so King, the, uh, the state and fit intersection meets warrant number one and warrant number two. And what, what is this, what are these signal warrants? What does this eight hour, eight hour vehicle volume mean? Um, basically it's a ratio of the major street volume to the minor street volume. So you have to have uh, over 500 vehicles in one hour on the major street and at least 150 vehicles per hour on the minor street. Typically that ratio of volume is enough to say, hey, uh, that minor street volume is getting to a point where it really can't enter into the major street. So that, that's, those are the numbers that go into that. And as you can see, I've highlighted in, in purple here, during, and this has to, you have to be, exceed those volumes for an eight hour period in one day. And so these, these periods so happen to be um, eight o'clock, 12 o'clock, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So basically the, the, the PM is when you have our highest volume exceedances. Um, and by a significant margin, you can see, you know, 803 vehicles uh, at three o'clock, 276, so that's quite a bit. I mean, when we see these numbers, it's, it's very easy for us to typically say, oh, it, it's met the eight hour warrant um, with, by, by a significant margin. If, if these volumes showed up as, you know, 510 vehicles to 160 vehicles, um, we wouldn't be as confident that a signal would be warranted here. And, and even if it did meet the warrant, maybe that's a good uh, instance where, hey, we'd look at that warrant number 10, that engineering judgment, and said, hey, yeah, it met the warrant, but it didn't really meet it um, with high confidence or with high, um, by, by a wide margin. And so in this case, we did actually not meet the warrant for, for crash experience, warrant number seven. Um, you actually need more than five crashes per year to meet that signal warrant. So in this case, uh, for this three year study period, we did not meet it. Um, however, we met the, the volume warrants, which um, typically was the, the main driver for this, was the, the, the peak hour delay in the congestion at the intersection. And so our proposed conditions um, at this, intersection and this is this is kind of the, the rendering of the whole project and I won't get into this too much um, and Donna actually already spoke to the, the current construction costs. Um, the proposed conditions um, will be we looked at multiple different alternatives so before putting a signal in we actually looked at an all-way stop we looked at just adding a lane on State Street uh, a right turn lane to to allow those right turns to get out of the way for other people on State Street making left. So the final alternative was ultimately to put a signal in. And so all, each one of those alternatives, we run this same checkbox. Does it meet the signal warrants? Is there, will it increase the crash history? Um, those those kind of get run for all the alternatives. And what we ended up with, with a preferred was a traffic signal um, installation. And that image that you're kind of looking at is very similar to what that intersection will look like upon completion. It'll be one overhead structure 
um, with, with posts mounted on the sides. Um, so not as intru intrusive as a typical intersection where you'll see mast arms um, or overhead structure at each approach, kind of you know a four-way box uh, is typically how we describe them. So we were able to kind of limit the amount of uh, aesthetic intrusion into this residential neighborhood. The last thing we want is this, this intersection to look like a big intersection. So we're not gonna change the curb lines here. Um, it's basically, we're just going to core a mast arm and install posts um, and replace the wheelchair ramps. Add in um, exclusive pedestrian crossings. So that's a really important uh, improvement, especially with that one pedestrian accent. So people will now have a fully accessible pedestrian signal um, and be able to cross um, meeting all of the current state codes. And, and really with that, that's kind of how we, we come to warranting or, meeting or, or coming to a signal at this intersection. And I think now it's, it's fair to say we can open it up to your comment and hear your concerns and any issues you might have with this proposed condition and certainly go back and we can look at and take, take everything under advisement. And that, that's really it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So because there are so many people here, um, I think it might be best, uh, I saw two hands right now um, and three. And so uh, I guess we'll start with a couple of people and four um, and then maybe just queue up if, if that's okay and try to uh, address one question at a time. And certainly, comments will also be recorded. Morning. So, where? Did, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I wonder if people could maybe come up to the lectern and let us know. If, is it possible for people to say who they are and where they live? Yes, I was going to ask yeah. that, especially for Laura, since she'll be taking some notes when you come to the lectern. And please speak up because you're speaking this way, but you have so many people behind you. So please speak up, say your name and your address, and. Um, We'll take it from there. I'd like to ask this gentleman and then the one in the back. A point of clarification. Earlier in your presentation, you said that all the comments, the door was closed on comments, though. So do any of our observations or comments have any impact on I'll moving I'll, forward? I'll let, I'll let, um, yeah, the official, the official comment period for Mass DOT is closed. The official comment period. At this point, we continue to welcome feedback from folks, and it will be taken under advisement that the official comment period is over. Okay. Is it a fait accompli? And again, that's important to note because that's important to note because if we don't want people to conflate this process, which is really an informational meeting, with the legal required uh, process that Mass Doc. Again, this is a Mass Doc project, and what they're required to do is you know, hold a 25% hearing. I'm sorry, sir, did you have a question? No, I just, I was asking, was this a fait accompli, is it? Oh, and so could you answer the question, is this a fait accompli? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that it's, I think that what's important for me to say is we take all feedback under advisement. So I, I referenced um, three other projects, Con Street, Damon Road, um, the, the roundabout on North King Street, where there were changes that were made after the 25% design public okay. hearing. Okay. So, to answer your question, is it? Not necessarily. But depending on our analysis of the feedback that we receive here, it may be. Thank you for that question. Mm. Um, and again, I'll go back to the order I saw, which is this gentleman, one in the back, then I saw this woman here, and then I think I'm just going to have to end, Risa. So that's four, and then we'll kind of try to get the next the next group. Um, we know that four order, and then we'll just move up. And there may be questions that are raised in the, in the process of hearing others. Here's so not to waste more time, sir. And please, again, state your name and address. Hi, I'm Mike Netto, and I run North Shore Seafood, which is on the corner of Finn and King. So it looks to me, looking at the at the, uh, the map up here, that uh, Finn Street, where our building is on King, um, on Finn Street rather, looks like it's going to be widened for another lane. Am I correct? Yeah, that is correct. Yes, okay, we're so adding a right turn. The current sidewalk will be taken away. That lane will be added in, and the next sidewalk will be added in to 
the property line that our, our landlord has currently. Am I not correct? That is correct. It will be a sidewalk. Uh, the property, uh, we are still working out the details of, of any sort of uh, property impacts. Um, keep just keep it mind them. And I should have mentioned this before. This is a 25% design, so there's still part of the mass review process. There's 75, 100, and yes, means we have three more design iterations for this process. So um, certainly, that this is the current proposed uh, design is, is adding that right turn in, lane in and the sidewalk. I guess one of the concerns that I would have, obviously, is that we have two entrances to that building. One is on Fenn Street, one is on King Street. Okay, and I remember in the 80s that the work was done in the roadways and that road was bridged over with steel plates and everything else to get into the building. And the previous owner to the building that I'm in now almost went out of business because people couldn't get in and out. So obviously my main concern is, is how is this going to affect our business and the business that's in that building with us, which is a package store. Um, seeing that we're going to be having large deliveries uh, from the liquor store with big trucks coming in that usually have to come in from both entrances and leave and exit the other way. That's a major concern. I wish the guy who owns the package store was here because maybe he could ask, ask a question about it. Um, that's a concern. Um, and you said it's going to start in 2020 to 2021, roughly? Project. Uh, the project will be advertised uh, in fiscal year 2021. So typically, um, that will be September of 2020. It'll be advertised, and construction will start in the spring of 2021. Okay. Okay. Uh, and is all the work along that corridor going to be taking place all at the same time, or is it going to be done incrementally? So the work is. The construction means and methods is up to the contractor. Generally, on a project of this of of this um, context, you um, no major full depth reconstruction. It's typically what we call it. this is just a milling and overlay project. So, the contractor may work in different areas um, at different times, or there's going to be periods, especially when they're paving or when they're doing sidewalks, where of course um, you know they're going to pave the road in, in one pass, so to speak. Um, so it's tough at this point to determine if, if it's going to be done incrementally, but in general the project's going to be bid as one project. So one day they might be uh, at King and State, um, King and Finn, the other, the other day they might be down at Summer in King. Um, but at this time, it's a little difficult to tell yeah. what the daily construction. I guess the, the main thing is too is what kind of traffic types. I mean, we have types now, and I see at completion that it is going to alleviate a lot of problems because that's been some of our concern. And my window, where I, I sell fish, I have a huge window. I look out every day. I see people coming down that are handicapped. They can't cross, and I can see where there's pedestrians could be hit. And uh, the courtesy of people coming around those corners is not there, believe me. I don't have to, I can speak from experience from looking at that. Um, but uh, how long is this project going to take place? Uh, how long will it take place? Just uh, Right now, I believe we're carrying uh, a 20 month construction period. Uh, that includes winter shutdown. Um, a project of this magnitude tip typically will be at 20 months. Now the contractor, um, there's no incentives or disincentives on this project for Mass DOT, um, like some highway projects. So he may, he or she may or may not go faster or slower, but typically 20, a 20 month period. But that's a conservative. All right, I'm a little, uh, I think you've answered what you could for me. I mean, like I say, we, we got to be concerned about how we're going to be able to do business where we are. Yeah, and just during, during the construction, so, as part of the mass stop projects, it is a requirement that all access to businesses remain open at all times. Um, so, in terms of, I know you had concerns over previous projects that may have plated and people couldn't get in. Um, of course, you know when the uh, when the contractor is repairing your, the driveway apron, um, there might be short periods during the day where hey, you know they're paving, they're actually improvements. Um, but in terms of you know. 
basically from 7.30 to 3.30 that they're, mm -hmm. during one day um, there might be a disruption, but after that the, the contract is required to, to have all access to the business open. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure we know, uh, just, just briefly, I know there's three more people that raised their hands, and I'm just paying attention. Do we expect N4, N5, N6, N7, and N8? So, just to get a sense of how many people will be will be addressing how long we're here. So we have eight people who have some questions, and Councilor Nash would like to address Mr. Neto's question. Yeah, I, I just want to give a, a brief overview, and Nick, feel free to interrupt me. At this particular intersection by where, where your business is, uh, as you can see, there's going to be four crosswalks put in. This, this is going to be turned into a four-way intersection so that the property directly across the street, which is the former Blida Honda lot, will now be part, whatever goes in there will be part of this intersection. And also that, you know, as you noted, there's the right turn lane on state, which will help with uh, the traffic buildup there. But in terms of uh, pedestrian safety, you can see all of the crosswalks there and that the signals will be timed so the pedestrians will have time to cross. Right now, they have to compete with the left turn from King Street onto uh, Finn Street, and it's it's dangerous. And thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Councilor. I saw this gentleman in the back, then this woman, and then I think it was Lisa, and then I'm gonna have to you know see who else, because we have many people with questions and concerns. And your name and address, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Stephen Good. I'm at 20 Aldridge Street. Um, I'm here principally about the um, state and Finn signalization. Um, <clears throat> And as I look around, I see a lot of other faces from Aldrich Street because nobody on Aldrich Street was aware of the 25% uh, meeting. Uh, had we been aware, I'm sure a number of us would have come. Um, our concern is primarily about safety, and I'm here because I have a baby and a four-year-old, um, and my four-year-old and our, the neighbor kids often play in the street. It's a sleepy little street because it's effectively dead-ended on both sides. Our concern is that if um, traffic is impeded on State Street that's trying to go through and then get bottlenecked, um, they might try to jog through on Aldrich. So my first question really, and I, you don't have to answer this right now, but I wanted to know, if it, have you looked at the knock-on effects to other streets of signalizing this intersection? Um, I'm glad that this work overall is being done. Um, King Street is a mess, Finn Street's a mess, King and Finn is terrible, State and Finn is terrible. I'm a little bit concerned that the uh, addition of Finn and State is um, being, concerned, being considered as an add-on in a vacuum, if that makes sense, that most of the work is along King Street and that's being considered in an integrated fashion. This feels like it was tacked on a little bit. I admit it's definitely a bad intersection, but um, part of the reason, in my opinion, that it's a bad intersection is that as you said, the volume on state is very high for the type of street that it is. And if you look at straight state street between about Sirio's um, Market and Finn Street, you see that there are wide sections where um, there's no parking on one side. It's effectively two lanes wide. Once it's straight, and yet it's only one one lane. Those are the sections where people speed. And so I see a lot of traffic accelerate down State Street and then come to essentially a screeching halt at Finn and then get frustrated that they can't turn there. So if we're gonna look at State and Finn, I would really appreciate hearing um, whether you guys have considered the, the, the whole context of State and why there is so much traffic on it rather than putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, so yeah, those are I mean, my two questions. A lot of these, a lot of times these type of projects, we try to take a holistic approach and, and you know, really look at a general or region of traffic. The problem is, is where do you stop in the city? So you look at state, but then you go another thousand feet, and there's another intersection that's really bad, and then you go another thousand feet. So at some point, we need to say, okay, under the the funding that's available through Mass DOT, what can we do with that money? Um, can I so as can part I of the stop here for a second because I, I'm also an engineer by training, and my thought process would not be we have resources, what are we going to do with them? It's what is the problem and how do we solve the problem? And then do we have the resources? What are the right resources? 
So I'm a little bit concerned by what you're saying, which is something that I've seen in a lot of discussion about planning, which is we've got this money, let's use it. Yeah. Um, no, we've got a problem, let's solve it. So I. I so as far I, I as, as far as the gen no, no, that's fine. I, I totally, I totally understand where you're coming from. In terms of looking at uh, the general State Street corridor as a region, um, that was not done as part of this this planning process. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree with you that if 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 there are uh, improvements that need to, to occur within a, a larger area in this neighborhood, uh, a planning process and uh, a study needs to take place to kind of address those issues and. You know, we sh it, it should not just be one intersection at a time. However, this intersection is integral to the King and Finn traffic operations and the traffic patterns. So we do kind of look at a, a regional model. And the problem that we're, we're seeing is, is that the King Street corridor is so congested now that people are using State Street to avoid King Street. And so we were aware of that. And so we wanted to look at why What's going to happen when we improve King Street? Is traffic going to get better or worse? And so what happens is we move some of these this traffic volume, this expected volume, back onto King Street. And what we found is State Street is still very bad. And so the way those traffic patterns work, and, and that's kind of how the culmination of some of these right turning lanes onto Finn Street and off of Finn Street, that's kind of how that process went. Is the, the way people are commuting is they're trying to, to get to avoid downtown by going down State Street. Sure. So no matter, I think, what you do, what we're doing even on King Street, we found that people are still going to avoid downtown and go down State Street. Therefore, we felt it uh, important to, to look at that King and State, or that Finn and State intersection. And that's kind of why it looks like it's a little bit isolated. <coughs> But in our analysis, it's, it's really important as part of this project and the traffic patterns. However, I do agree with you that in terms of the, the overall approach, um, needs to be looked at in more of a, a zoomed out view of State Street and, and kind of what, what needs to be done there. And as, as part of our job, I think is as the city undertook this project, I, I, don't, I just don't think that was part of the, the scope of, of kind of the King Street corridor improvements. And the first question I had about um, knock-on effects in neighborhood streets. So the knock-on effects in neighborhood streets, so what we're anticipating is going to happen is that because of the level of service is going to be increased so much at State and Finn that people won't want or feel the need to, do, to cut through on any of the side streets. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, and it, it'd, be, it'd be behoove us to predict that and say that that's not going to happen. However, the data is telling us that because this level of service and these queues are going to be improved um, by such a large margin that the, the effects of cut through traffic should hopefully be reduced. And now as an engineer, I, would, you know, I, would, I can't say for sure without studying and analyzing Aldrich Street specifically if that's going to happen. However, it is our prediction that you know, with the reduction in queue, people aren't going to feel the need to, oh, there's this huge line of traffic on State Street. Let me take a left on the summer, cut up Aldrich, or vice versa. There's, um, I'm sure some might have the questions, well, oh, from, I'm going to be stopped at Finn Street now, yeah. uh, going towards King Street. Uh, now the queue's going to back up towards Aldrich. Yeah. Let me cut down Aldrich that's and go that's down. That's so that's, so we, we definitely looked at that. I'm sure you guys have concerns, and I, and I can get into more detail about that. Um, so it, it's there, it's a two-way two street, so to speak, um, with Aldrich Street. So at least going northbound, we're expecting that people are going to want to go to the intersection because they can safely get on the, to, to Finn Street a lot easier in a lot less time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I just want to make sure that we have a review and then release it. And then I'll go around again. Can your name and address, please? Yeah, I'm Karen Foster. Um, I live at 155 Grove Street. But I'm here, I'm the executive director of All Out Adventures. We're on the corner of Satan Finn. And so thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, more of a question and then a comment. All Out Adventures is a nonprofit, and we run outdoor recreation programs for people who have disabilities. We have a lot of people come, you guys have probably seen all the recumbent trikes and hand cycles, that's from us. 
Um, so people come and, and they take out recumbent trikes and hand cycles on the bike path. And, and honestly, I dedicate staff time to walking people across the intersection. So I love the, the focus on pedestrian safety um, and on accessibility. Um, I'll be able to have my staff do something besides walk, walking people across the intersection. Um, a question for you. You said a dedicated pedestrian light. Do you mean all traffic will stop um, for pedestrians there? So that is, as of right now, the state and Bain Street intersection is going to be an exclusive pedestrian phase, so all traffic will stop. Okay. However, the city is looking to kind of standardize how, um, what the vehicle and pedestrian expectations is of what happens when you get to these signals. So Main Street, right in downtown Main and Pleasant, that everyone comes to a stop, everyone can cross. What is trending and, and what is kind of the, the, the methodology moving forward is that they're going to be concurrent, what's called concurrent pedestrian phasing. So the pedestrians walk <coughs> along with the through traffic movements. And you've probably seen some signs that says right turn yield to pedestrians. Um, I think there's one at uh, near Al, uh, near Smith. Yeah. Um, so that is something that we're looking at. And the reason why we look at that is because it allows us to not have to stop all of the traffic for the pedestrians and it allows us to keep the traffic flow moving. However, at this intersection, we probably will not do that. It'll probably be everybody stop um, for the pedestrians, just due to the pedestrian volumes. And that it's um, another reason why we do concurrent, what's called concurrent pedestrian phasing, is to coordinate traffic signals. Um, but that's primarily going to be on the Main Street corridor. We'd like to platoon vehicles along a corridor. Um, in order to do that, if one signal stops for pedestrians, that really throws off the, the signal coordination and progression. Um, however, because State and Finn is outside, that was a long-winded answer to your question, but... <laughs> but a helpful one. I, I hope that was helpful. A lot of the people I see who have disabilities who are using wheelchairs and sure. motorcycles um, feel very intimidated by vehicle traffic mm -hmm. near them, and that extra time to get going is something that, that is important to them, that idea of, of vehicle stopping. And another thing, too, about that extra time is a new kind of technology that we've been implementing as well is called an LPI, leading pedestrian interval. And so even with that concurrent pedestrian phasing, we we actually do stop all traffic for like three or four seconds, which gives that pedestrian just enough time to get into the intersection <coughs> where vehicles can see them. Um, so they're more visible, even, even during that, uh, they're not fully protected, at least they're in the roadway and not standing off, you know, back near a building or on the sidewalk when a left turning car or a right turning car can't see them. So there are new kind of techniques that we've been looking at. And I believe LPI is, uh, there's one near Smith too. Yeah, we, we instituted an LPI, a signal at, at Maine, um, right by Smith. And we've actually had very positive feedback on that. Okay. Um, and then just a quick comment with it, because I know these things matter. A lot of people who have disabilities, their bikes are very low. The recumbent trikes and the hand cycles um, are just inches off the ground. And people have expressed me frustration in other communities where they can't reach the buttons. Um, so I, I know ADA compliance yep. probably has something there, but just an awareness that that people are sitting low and, and sure. won't be able to reach a standard. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a guideline called the PROAG, which is the Pedestrian Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and I didn't mention this, but all of these signals are going to be what's called APS signals or accessible pedestrian signals. So they'll have, and they have to meet certain requirements to do that, they'll have audible feedback from the push buttons, they'll be tactile. Um, so you don't have to like push the button really hard and just cover your hand over. Also, the buttons need to be what it, what's called within operable parts is a certain section under that PROAG. Um, and it has to be between that 36 inches and that 42 inches. So, um, we're, and within reach, it's called, uh, it's like a reach requirement that we have to meet as well. And all of those things are very sensitive. Mass CFT is really hot on the subject. Um, so we definitely take that into consideration. And a lot of times, those decisions drive why uh, a way a certain um, wheelchair ramp or sidewalk is laid out. A lot of times we lay them out and might say, well, why is the sidewalk this way? It's because we're, we're actually trying to meet those standards. Okay. So. Great. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Risa? And then after Risa, were there some other folks like oh, George, yeah. uh, Meg, and George, Doug? Mm -hmm. 
Delta and one, two. I think I've got in my head seven people, and I'll try to keep that line up. Yes, yes, I, I think I counted seven, but I, I can only, you know, I'll just try to keep keep at least these five at a time. To... Okay, thank you, Lisa. Hi, my name is Lisa Sullivan. I live at 28 Aldridge Street, and I'm one of the two people with my other neighbor who, um, I happen to just have a friend in another part of town who said, did you know about this thin State Street light? And I was like, no. And, and I, um, so we spread the word to our neighbors, and there was a lot of people responding, um, not knowing about the announcement. So my macro sort of comment is that I think communication with us all in the 21st century might need to be change in the city because um, I was, I mean, there were a lot of people who didn't know about it. So that doesn't seem right to me. So, and so therefore it's like, well, hopefully there is advice, you know, under advisement, which is great, but, and it's all very interesting. I love complete streets and all about that, but it did seem like um, something might have been skipped. And one of them, which a lot of neighbors asked about was the four-way stop that you just said something about. So if you could comment sure. on that, how that got rolled out. So the four-way stop, is, it was one of our concepts that we looked at at State and Finn. Um, and that one was, was rolled out fairly quickly, primarily due, not because of the safety uh, fact, obviously having people stop, um, slows traffic down, it's safer for pedestrians, um, but primarily because we found in our analysis that traffic backed up significantly into King Street um, by a large margin spilled way over and was causing significant congestion. At, at the new the new intersection. Um, also the level of service that it resulted in, you're still having vehicles stop, um, 8,000 vehicles stop on State Street um, constantly versus um, the signalized operation which allowed you know, pockets of, of 10 to 15 vehicles to be flowing at one point. So um, we do have our traffic analysis and I, I don't know at some point at break it, do we have the always stop uh, model? I'll have Brady will check. We can actually show you the uh, what it. Our model is actually it's, it runs a simulation. It's like a, and it's a video, and it actually see, you can see what the intersection is going to look like. And I'll I'll see if Brady has that model. Um, but that those were the reasons that it was primarily ruled out. Ruled out was um, the impacts it was having on the community. So then I would just go back to what Steve mentioned before is the fact that it's taken out of context of State Street, which is a terrible street to bike on, mm -hmm. and um, dangerous at summer and state to cross. So the idea that we're doing this part, and I get it, you can't mm -hmm. do everything at once, right. but how it will affect Alder Street, which is a great street, it's one of the like, smallest streets in downtown. Um, so I think we all want to be represented in this decision. Sure, and, and there's you know, this isn't a permanent solution, uh, or this isn't a permanent, um, just because we put a traffic signal, or, or if, if we end up with a traffic signal, I'm not saying that's, that's going to happen, um, that, that doesn't mean that we still can't look at other uh, improvements or mitigation measures that may, or may have resulted from the signal installation. Um, for example, if, if we put a signal in here and we said, oh man, there's a ton of cut through traffic on Alden Street, we can put the signal back into flashing operation, and it will operate exactly how it is doing today, um, with you know a click of a button. Um, so n none of this is a, a permanent change that's going to be happening. Uh, at least we won't. There's going to be no permanent negative change. Hopefully, there's a permanent positive change we can implement. Um, but I don't know if that that eases any of your concerns about. Um, so that's the communication, like if everyone will do, like everyone's coming down, then you talk to DPW? Yeah, you talk to DPW sure. and, and we will get it. And, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the LPI at Maine and Smith College. Um, that LPI was instituted based on feedback from the public. So, it, you know, we listen to everybody and then we do what we can to mitigate whatever the concern is. Thank you. And there are, there are uh, numerous uh, mitigation measures such as uh, you know curb extensions and bump outs that we can do to really dissuade people from going down all the street in general too if cut there's become problems. Sure. And then I think there's another question here you'll have. Yeah, but let me just get the folks who signed up. I think it's, there's about five or six. So George, and then we'll get back to your question. Is that okay? I'm pointing to you who's pointing at me. Yeah, is it okay if we 
let the folks who've raised their hands here. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I had my hand up earlier too. Oh, okay. so. oh I apologize. No, no, please. The podium is in the way. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put you in before Meg, if that's okay. Okay? Something with me, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not so hi, George Coe. Um, I live at 234 State Street. My wife, Deb Orger, is here also. She lives with me, which is just about three houses down north, heading towards the bike trail and stop and shop. Um, so we are 100% in favor of the signalization of this intersection because we use it so often as pedestrians, as a bicyclist, and in our cars. And even though we've lived there just for about six years, we constantly see and hear the conflicts that happen with cars and with bicyclists and with pedestrians at that intersection. It's just very, very dangerous. Um, and I think you know it was interesting to see that data back in 2015 that there was 219 bicyclists. Here we are in 2019, 2019. I bet there's another 20% more bicyclists and probably more pedestrians, which is a good thing. People are walking more, people are using their bikes more, but in, in, because of that, this intersection is just really, really um, dangerous. So anything that can be done, especially the signalization, we feel is going to be a real benefit, um, especially that it can be activated at, at either end um, by pedestrians is going to be great. I also, my, my question would be, I assume there's kind of a video control too, so that if there isn't a car stop that State Street, the light will stay red or it will cycle through real quickly. Absolutely. Right? So cars won't queue up all the time back to Aldrich if there's no traffic on State Street. That's there correct. Won't be yeah. a permanent it'll be very advanced. I mean, it'll be the latest technology, and, yeah. and that's exactly what it does. Is it, um, we call it gapping out. So if there's not a car within three seconds, typically, is the clearance interval or the, or the, the passage time that we use. Um, it'll gap out and then it'll switch to State Street and, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so it'll be very, uh, we call it snappy. <laughs> just snappy. So, good. so, you know, it doesn't lead around. It doesn't just, yeah. there's no cars coming. Why is it still green? Why am I not going? It, that, that will not happen. Great. As far as Great. 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 And, and, and I understand the concerns of my neighbors on Aldridge Street because State Street now <coughs> is a cut through for folks who queue up heading towards Finn on State Street. They get frustrated. So they know they can't turn left because all that traffic's coming up thin. So they bolt across State Street mm -hmm. and they cut down Stoddard or Perkins mm -hmm. in order to try to beat traffic mm -hmm. and go up um, Prospect there. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I also serve on the planning board. So I, I, I run into a lot of these, uh, the traffic inequity sometimes in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, dispersing our traffic through different streets really is a kind of a, a traffic equity in some ways. It's unfortunate. I know you have a very quiet street. My wife and I walk down there all the time. It's a lovely street night. I surely trust that it's not going to be impacted a lot. But it will alleviate and will forestall a lot of situations that currently happen with conflicts of cars and pedestrians. And risk. So thank you for moving ahead on this. Thanks. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so why don't you join us and then I'll ask uh, Meg and Robin. I, I just don't know your name. Sarah Cartan. Uh, my name is Sarah Cartan, and I'm a resident of the corner of Aldrich and Summer. Um, and I have a 10-year-old who plays on Aldrich Street all the time. And I really am, am, am I, I wanted to, you mentioned one thing, which is that people go on state to avoid town. P people, people go on state to avoid the light at King. That's why people go on state. So you move a light up to state, and people will go on Aldrich to avoid the light at state. There's just no question in my mind about it. So that that you know, there's that certainly might happen. However, the traffic on King Street is so bad that that people avoid, regardless of if they're avoiding downtown or wherever they're going, they just don't want to drive on King Street. Um, so by fixing that congestion on King Street, we're hoping that some traffic transfers back over to King Street. However, 8,000 vehicles. There is no way 8,000 vehicles is ever going to leave State Street. Um, the, the goal is hopefully we can take maybe 1,000 a day and take them off. Um, it would be great if we could eliminate all vehicles and people could walk everywhere. I mean, that, that's the ideal situation. However, that, that's such a high, I was saying before, it's such a high volume of traffic um, that you won't notice the difference between you know, 8,000 vehicles and in six or seven thousand, the, the traffic will have a, you'll you'll perceive it as the same. So, and that that's kind of, of why the signal you know is is warranted there. 
So, so here's a here's a thought, and I and I haven't thought I haven't I, I, I haven't thought this through, and I, of course I'm not a modeler, so I haven't modeled any of this. But but if 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 you really need to put a light there, how about also putting light at the horrible intersection at Summer and State, which I have seen accidents at. I saw a bicycle get hit there, and the person flew off their bike. It was horrible. Um, and and State and Summer. And if you put a light at State and Summer as well, then that will dissuade people from using State. We did look, so uh, State and Summer, we did analyze the intersection. It was part of the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the analysis network. Mm -hmm. um, and under all conditions, we actually found that the traffic there, um, or the level of service, so that the report card um, was level of service B, so it was not, um, it, it would not meet a signal. For cars, maybe, but not for pedestrians. It's oh, extreme, cert no, certainly it's not. It's extremely hard to cross the street yeah. there. Yeah. I'm, I'm only talking for a vehicular warrant for, for a signal. Uh, the, the pedestrians, um, there's no pedestrian analysis of, of uh, well, that's not true. There, there, is a, there is a warrant for a pedestrian signal there. However, because it's a four way intersection, it would just be a standard signal. Um, However, we did not analyze, we did not um, count pedestrians at that intersection and look at warranting that. However, we did analyze it for, for vehicles. Uh, well, maybe, is that something that could be added to this in the next phase oh, of certainly. the design? To, to, yeah. to, to, to look, I mean, before you yeah. the finalizing the plan. Certainly, if, that, if there's a lot of, we can definitely go back and take a look at it, especially if, if, the, if, the, if there's a pedestrian, there's a high line of pedestrians there, we can certainly look at. Um, of if there's something that needs to be addressed at that intersection, because it is part of our study in the area network. I, I think that would be great, because then that would that would increase the, uh, the, the, the I mean, it, it, integrating it more, getting back to what Stephen Good was saying earlier, uh, uh, integrating it more mm -hmm. with, with the other streets around the area is going to benefit the whole project, I think. The only thing that, and I will caution, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to try to get everyone's hopes up. Is that Matt, when Mass DOT, because of state funding, Mass DOT is going to look at is this worth the state dollar investment to put a signal here? Um, and they're going to look at that level of service for vehicle traffic. Because Summer Street is, is one way going towards King Street, it is unlikely that the, the warrants that are going to be met are going to justify a signal installation. However, if the, if the warrant for, for pedestrians meets, we can certainly go back to Mass DOT and argue that case. Mm -hmm. If uh, mm -hmm. and but it it will be under state review, so that the state will have to take a look at that as well. But certainly, I think it's it's worth looking at again, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not too soon to rule that out mm -hmm. by by any touch of imagination. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And my, my last uh, question had to do with what you were just uh, at the very end of talking to Risa. You said. Well, there are things we can do on Aldrich Street to decrease traffic. What are those sure. things? Sure. So um, basically, we're, we're going to try to dissuade people from driving down. <clears throat> and you, know, you can say, oh, we can add speed bumps and that type of nature. But there's, there's less obtrusive things uh, other than speed bumps, such as you know, traffic calming measures, basically. So um, reducing reducing the, the roadway width, which <clears throat> causes people to drive slower and not want to cut cut down that. So I'm not saying we can reduce it anymore. I'm just speaking in general in general terms. Um, there's signage, um, curb extensions at the actual you know fins or intersections, really making it. Hey, this is a really this almost looks like a one way street. Can I even go down here? There there are certain measures such as those um, that can be implemented um, to kind of dissuade dissuade vehicles. Mm -hmm. Signage is, is, a, is a common one. Um, narrowing the roadway typically mm -hmm. is, is one that ha is really effective. Um, I'd have to check with some of our engineers. I'm not like a, a traffic calming expert, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, where I'd have to check with our other traffic engineers. Um, but there's certainly uh, multiple measures that we can look at to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And, and my, my my daughter requested that I, I read her petition, so she wrote a petition, which she's just started to get kids signing, which says, and I quote, we bike and play on Aldrich Street, and we don't want a lot of cars coming down our street. <laughs> and she's had several kids sign it from the street, which I can give, get to you guys. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Meg. I'm Meg Robbins. I live at 33 Aldrich Street. I'm right across the street from Lisa. Um, and we don't mean to be troublemakers. I mean, I 
was really concerned when Risa was notified by somebody else who was on the Transportation and Parking Commission, I believe, about there being a proposed traffic light one block from our house. And I live right behind um, Outdoor Adventures. So through my back window, I see State Street, and through my side window, I see Finn Street. And I, I know there's a perception, and you have these numbers. I don't know when you did the study on both of those streets. But my perception of the traffic on those two streets is that it's not good, but it's a lot, it's a lot better than many streets in Northampton. Yes. There's, and there's a certain level of patience that it takes to be able to get from point A to point B. And I, my biggest question is, where do we go as a city if we start thinking about how we deal with cars? And we don't start with thinking about what's the big view? Do we have a traffic light every single intersection in Northampton? Because people need to get from where they are to where they want to go. We have a lot of commuter traffic that just wants to get up to Route 9. There aren't a lot of avenues to do that. I don't know if you guys are the consultants on the Damon Road light at an industrial park, but that hasn't worked out well. Um, and it was a big project. There was a lot of conversation about it. It went way back. I don't know what the forethought or what the inclusion of the immediate neighborhood was around there. It's not a residential neighborhood. I am really, really concerned about the process of this decision because it totally went over the heads of anybody who should have had input a long time ago. The 25% meeting that was held by the mascot was listed in city meetings. That was it. I don't know about you, but I don't actually look at those. But where it was listed was about the King Street renovation project. There was nothing in there about a traffic light. Nothing in there. There was nothing online about it. In fact, when stuff was finally put online, and the DPW is doing a great job of putting stuff online. You're one of the best in the city now, and that's really helpful. Um, in fact, the handout by the Massaw engineer didn't include the traffic light on the map of the handout she gave. It was in the larger brochure, and it was in the PowerPoint, but it was pretty clear that it was an add-on. And when you're talking about the federal and state funds and what the data is you need to have in order to get a traffic light, or if the money is there, I'm really nervous. It sounds very much as though um, Somebody decided, in addition to the King Street renovations, which I think everybody's in favor of, we've been aware of that for a long time, it needs to happen, it's a great project. When it suddenly starts to have an impact on a city residential street, that is a whole different conversation. And it needs to be a community conversation. There is no discussion about the impact of light, of noise. Um, I have suddenly become a lot more knowledgeable about traffic lights than I ever wanted to be. But what I have read in other cities and talked to friends who are engineers, they don't solve problems. They are the last go-to when you have a problem with traffic. Um, Bruce Lowenthal, who can't be here tonight, actually did submit a letter to us. He's on the James. Oh, James, sorry. I keep calling him Bruce. <laughs> um, he's on the, your committee, but he's on the pedestrian and biking. And he actually said, 10 years ago, he put in an application for State Street traffic calming which has been at the top of the list for 10 years. Mm -hmm. For 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the city has not addressed traffic calming on State Street. Mm -hmm. Is traffic an issue on State Street? Yeah, it's a skinny street. I walk down it all the time. It's an issue. Um, people speed straight down and straight back. They slow down in some areas of it, and then they just go for it. But as a pedestrian who crosses at the Finn and State Street intersection all the time, and somebody who drives through there, what really amazes me is how many people blow through the stop sign. And you call it sneaking through? It's not. That's why the accidents happen there. I have no assurance that a stoplight is going to make any difference to that. And from what I read about stoplights, they go from being angle collisions to being rear end collisions, which are really dangerous. Um, we also have a very heavy uh, emergency vehicle route. That is the route for. Uh, Ambulance is going to Cooley Dickinson. That adds one more light on their journey to be safe, safe, you know, transversing from one place to another. Um, and in addition, it's not just that, it's coming around the corner of Prospect Street, which is, you know, you might peel off and go this way on Prospect, but you have to slow to 20 miles an hour to get around that corner. So you're coming around that corner, you're coming down the hill, and you got a traffic light. Right, like, right there. And that's going to be brakes, that's going to be um, noise, that's going to be potential rear-end collisions. It raises a whole different 
level of what the activity is that's going to happen on that street. And it's not enough for me as a resident to hear the guesswork about how it might winnow the traffic on State Street and how it might make things safer and how it might be better in the long run. And if that's how we're going to have discussions about the future of how we signalize Northampton, that is a much bigger citywide discussion. And I really I appreciate the effort and the work that you've done that, but you're missing us. And we should have been part of that discussion from the very beginning. And I thank Jim very much for helping Maureen put this together. Um, I had a lot of trouble finding any notes from your commission about any of these discussions. It's, they're just not searchable. And no one could help with that. I don't know when the decision was made to include the traffic light, who in the city made that decision, who, who seconded it, who said it was OK, and how it became part of the submitted um, format to the state. And I think we need those answers. We really deserve them. And it would be nice if our city councilors were made aware of that and could share that more publicly. And it would be nice that in the future, when there's something that's important that involves neighborhoods, it's not just an item on the city agenda that you have to look up by going into the city records. So I don't actually have a question. <laughs> I just, no, good, I just good wanted to that. say what I needed to say. Yeah, so, no, yeah, I think all, all very important yeah. issues. No, certainly, and these are kind of, I think, some of the issues that I think it, it stems more than just this project. I think it's it's what what sort of thing the city needs to do in, it, to to really, you know, we don't want to signalize all of all of our okay, I mean, That's certainly not the goal. And and is there a, a a larger you know do we need to take a larger look at and how do we address these kind of things in the future? You know, but that starts first. Planning, right? That's exactly. first. We are a city that's supposed to be looking at the big picture before we take that big step. Cars running stop signs hit pedestrians. Cars running stop signs hit cyclists. Cars running signals will do the exact same thing. People on their bicycles don't get off to cross through mm -hmm. pedestrian crosswalks, right. which in the city you're supposed to. Disabled riders shouldn't be going across in things people can't see without somebody taller. I don't take my small grandchildren through any of those crosswalks without holding my hand. I have kids who go to Jackson Street. They hold my hand crossing the crosswalk because they know that cars can't see them. I won't. I wouldn't send them through a traffic light for the same reason. They can't be seen. So I would actually ask our counselors. I don't know if there's a way to go back and bring that message to say this is a huge question. It's something that we really need to address. It can't be in a charrette that happened in 2010 that results in a traffic light that happens in 2021. So thank you for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to respond? Uh, so we do look at roundabout is of course uh, an alternative we, we have to consider. I haven't talked about roundabouts tonight. Um, this would be a, a, a phenomenal intersection to implement a roundabout just because of the traffic distribution. However, roundabouts typically come with uh, significant property property impacts. Um, I just want to throw it out there that that is you know as, as the city's consultant and as traffic engineers, people say think traffic they think of traffic signals. Uh, we certainly, the roundabouts are our first option that we look at on every project. We, we would love to implement roundabouts and, and, and non-signalized improvements at every intersection. And not only for, for the traffic and, and the circulation and the flow part of things, but also from a, a maintenance perspective, um, the infrastructure, uh, maintaining the traffic signal equipment, that's very burdensome to the city. So these, these aren't decisions that that we make uh, without looking at, at you know a lot of different alternatives. You know, where we're not out here to you know go and put traffic signals there. Like, that's certainly not what what the city likes to do or, or what we're looking to do. So if that's any consolation of, of how we're looking at this project, um, I guess that that's that's what I can offer in terms of alternatives that we look at. And that's just, fine, but you're not the decision maker. Correct. You're a consultant hired by the city to give information to whom, who then decides who should be a larger part of that conversation, where do we go from here? Correct. Um, I want to make sure I, I see one in the back and I see one in the front and I see one there and I think, sir, you may have, well, why don't we start with you, ma'am, and then I'll move to sir and then to this woman in the front. Oh, I apologize. I'm really sorry. She had her hand up next to Red, or next to Meg, and it's hard for me to keep track of 20 people in Washington. So I apologize. 
Okay, I appreciate it. My name is Tracy Adamski. I live at 26 Aldrich um, here with a lot of uh, the other neighbors. So I appreciate the overview that you gave earlier regarding the history of this. Um, but to me, that's a history of the King Street Corridor. So even though we've been thinking about King Street from 2003, and there's been a lot of public input and charrettes and whatnot, this signal just came into play within the last few years without really a whole lot of public information. I've searched online to try and find some of the data behind the decisions, and this is the first time that I've been able to see anything other than a picture that shows we're putting lights here. It'd be very um, helpful to have some of this data that supports your decision um, up online so that those of us who are impacted by it have the opportunity to review it and be able to ask sure. more informed questions regarding it. We have a full, full report the city has access to that I'm sure. Um, it's a public document. Uh, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to upload it to the website. That, that'd be very helpful. And, uh, and thank you for addressing the roundabout. That was going to be one of my questions. Sure. My understanding is that that's the preferred option for the city. Mm -hmm. And it, and here, even though we don't, you don't have a lot of space on um, the north side, there is some open land on the south side. And I know taking land isn't always like a, a preferred mm -hmm. option. But you know, did you look at the potential for offset of a roundabout or you know a small roundabout that doesn't necessarily have to take you know the 18 wheelers through? Like, is there Certainly. The geometry or, yep. or the space there fit that geometry. There is. So there's the urban compact roundabouts. Um, however, even the smallest of the small roundabouts, because these streets are functionally classified as arterial roadways, so they have to be able to serve, um, you know, and it's, and it's kind of back to transportation equity. You know, I hate to say that we create all modes equally, but that includes trucks as well. Um, so to a truck to be able to go around that roundabout. Um, a truck, we're talking 18 wheeler, we're not talking you know, boxcar truck. We're, so the design vehicle that would be for this would not be a, a 18 wheeler like you'd see on an interstate. It would be what's called a single unit, unit truck, which is like a 40 foot long, the largest moving truck uh, that there is. Um, there's still, you, you actually, you can see the property line on this image. It's, it would require, regardless of what size roundabout, it would require uh, property taking on, yeah. on all intersections and all approaches. Um, and that's just, that, that typically is not something we'd like to, to move forward with. Um, even, even with taking property, there, this roundabout would be, the sidewalk would be in people's porches, um, just the way the geometry works out um, to lay out this roundabout here. And we're required to lay it out as part of the, the, the concept alternatives to math too. And those are in your report? Those are in the report, that's correct. Okay. Um, I'll say, um, similar to what uh, Stephen and Sarah had said, I also have two young children, mm -hmm. um, three and eight. We're riding our bikes. We have small yards, so our street is part of our, our yard, sure. essentially. Um, and there are folks who come down from other streets and also use our street to teach their kids how to ride bikes and, and to come, come enjoy. Our street um, is currently used as a cut through. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when people do use it as a cut through, they're driving pretty darn fast. Um, I think putting this light here will encourage more people to use this as a cut through. So if you are going to continue to move forward with having a light here before that goes in, I want to see that you've thought about impacts um, to traffic down our street and what mitigation you can provide. Um, we have a very narrow street right now when you know there's cars parked on either side. It sometimes functions almost as a one-way street, but again, we still, for the people who live on it, we kind of know and go a little bit slower because we're always looking out for each other's children. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we need other mitigation measures before that light's put in because it will end up being um, a cut through. Yeah, I think, you know, and I'm a parent, I have a three-year-old and I live on a very busy street and the last, the first thing is she goes out the front door, I'm just waiting to grab her. Okay. Um, and that that's like my biggest fear, so I totally get where you're coming from. I think countermeasures, we certainly should, you know, we, we should or can uh, work with the city to develop some countermeasures um, during this process that we can implement. Um, and, and very low cost too, um, that or relatively low cost to the to the other process. I'll say signage isn't going to work. Right. Um, no. I'm I, like like I said. I am not a traffic calming expert. That's kind of a separate uh, discipline um, in itself. Um, 
as you can see, it's, it's very sensitive. And we run into this a lot in other communities, so we have, we have professionals dedicated to, to traffic calming as its own expertise. Um, I, I, and I just, I just threw signing out there, and that's just one common one that we would install. But of course, there's others that we would look at. So yeah. certainly, I understand the, <clears throat> you know, the feel of your street, you, you know, it, it is part of your, your front yard, and it's part of your, your network of, of where your kids play. And, and the last thing we want is to have anyone speeding or cutting through down here. So um, <coughs> definitely something that, I, you know, we will continue to, to monitor. And at least for right now, the data is showing that the queuing and, and the delay at this signalized intersection is going to be an improvement over what it is now. So if people are cutting down your street right now, hopefully there's going to be less people cutting through. But if people aren't cutting down your street now, the data is showing, based on our analysis, that they are not going to be cutting down there once the signal is, is installed. So that I can say. So if your perception is right now that people are cutting down, then I think that we definitely have to look at <clears throat> a study or looking at what we can do to mitigate because there still could be, the, if people are cutting in there now, there still could be people that are just so used to going down there that they're going to continue to cut through regardless of what happens. Right. Right. However, if people aren't doing it now, I w it, would, it would, be, would be a very surprise based on what our data is showing just because it's such a, re uh, you're so reaffirmed that the, the level of service is going to improve at that intersection. I would, we would be quite shocked if there's continued cut through. Now again, like I said before, we can never say for sure that people won't cut down. <clears throat> However, that being said, I would say they do now, and if they come up, see okay, the so they line, do now. They are going to come yeah. down. Our and you know, yes. and this, this feedback is helpful because we don't we don't know. We didn't necessarily walk down all the street as part of this project, so this is why you're here to tell us. So if they cut down there now, maybe the city and as us as a consultant, you know, that's something we have to look at. And it is definitely a concern. If you feel like there is cut through traffic now, then I can't say for certain that that will that won't stop. So I, I think we should look at that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I just have two other questions. One, have you looked at the queuing analysis for the light at, mm -hmm. at Finn and Straight in State? Like, will it queue up beyond Alder Street or at the Alder Street intersection? So the queue, <clears throat> you, you have the distance. We, we did. So the, the queue length, I believe, is 100 and, and now this is the 95th percentile queue. So the, the worst queue during the worst traffic period the farthest that our analysis is showing, I'll give you a number. Uh, I think it was like a hundred and you have the Q analysis right there. I can give you the number. I think it's like 190 feet. So from that intersection, I'm not sure, quite sure what the distance from Alt Street is to State Street. Not there. Um, one block. <coughs> what is it? One block. Small block. Half a block. Small right. Block. So I mean, Half just block. just uh, I don't I can't say for certain what the. Exactly. Okay. I guess that's some other uh, piece of information that we would like to have. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll I can get you, I can get you that. Uh, let me see. more than one. Hold on, let me see. Is this the right? So the fifty so the average queue, fiftieth percentile, uh, is hundred and thirteen feet. And this is during the okay, yeah, this is during the morning peak hour. And it goes up to almost four hundred. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Eastbound traffic. So going towards King Street, seventy one feet. That's that's the average. So that that would not extend to the top street for sure. So during the, the worst, seventy-one feet. Seventy-one. Yeah, fifty percent. 
That's at that's the 50th percentile. So it's percentile, it's not actually average. So it's a good idea. Um, now the 95th percentile, which is the worst of the worst during the peak hour, is 200 feet. That's what our analysis is showing. It. And we don't know the distance. I don't. Know, I don't. We could find out. Uh, just looking at the image. Um, well, if it's two houses, it's probably a hundred feet. Yeah. Right. So. <coughs> also, something to keep in mind is that this, these cubes, lengths are, um, they're considering each car length to be 20 feet, which isn't always the case. That's a pretty conservative estimate. Yeah, so we've got 16 feet, probably 16 to 18 feet for, for car length, potentially, and you have a few feet in between. That's not a bad number to use. Well, for planning purposes, it, it still means that there could be an issue if we're that close to the intersection. I know it. <coughs> Satisfying. But it might be less than this. Right. Yeah, so here's, here's you can see here's Finn Street, here's all the street right here. Um, this frontage on this property is quite long, so <clears throat> during the during the, maybe the worst case scenario, potentially that would back up, but you know, again, these are these are just our analysis, so it plus or minus, it, it's very difficult to say, however. Um, without measuring that distance, uh, I can't say if it's going to back up. I mean, there might be a, a time when, yeah, sure, it backs up, but then five minutes later, it's gone. It's, it's tough to say. I guess the only other um, item I'd throw out there is you guys have spent 15 years studying the King Street Corridor, <coughs> starting to look at, you know, what do we need to do here to get into this point where you have you know, some really good options. And again, I'm very supportive of the work that you're looking at on the improvements that are, you're looking at on King Street. I would say if you're looking at State Street and, and the Finn Street State, Finn State Street intersection, that you take that as an entire corridor. Again, as someone who crosses this intersection umpteen times a week, it crosses the State and Finn Street um, section on my bike, with my kids, walking, walking with the dog. I would almost say that the State and um, Summer Street intersection mm -hmm. is a far more scary intersection mm -hmm. for me to be crossing because traffic is going down very fast down the road. Um, and honestly, people stop for me at Finn and State. They don't at Finn and Summer. And so if I'm thinking, you know, if you want to look at big picture, you know that State Street has a lot of traffic coming down on it. Look at that as a full corridor. Similar to what you're doing with King mm -hmm. Street, you're kind of looking that, at that holistically. Mm -hmm. I would really recommend looking at State Street Corridor holistically and not taking out this one intersection at this time. So I'm going to add that Tracy's an engineer too. That Alder Street. I, I'm, I'm actually, actually not an engineer. <laughs> I'm a planner. Planner. Yeah. Alder Street is full of people with great ideas. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but PDPC actually studied. Uh, State and Finn Street in 2002, Gary Rue, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, he actually wrote a, uh, did a study and a, a warrant analysis back. So there has been some planning studies, however, they are not to the extent that I think we could all agree is suitable for the State Street Quarter. I think the State Street Quarter, it warrants a, a, a large holistic approach. Um, a complete streets approach, just like we're doing on King Street, to see what what can we do um, on, on on State Street because you know that's that's a lot of traffic and it's a very residential area and I don't think that that street is suited at all to handle that that type of, of vehicular movement. Um, so there's there's no question, and I fully agree with you that State Street has its own uh, unique set of, of characteristics that need to be looked at and as part of the whole transportation model in, in Northampton and kind of north north of downtown. And I guess my concern is like if you're taking this one intersection out of that context, I recognize that mm -hmm. you're extending it down from King Street. I just think State Street is a bigger nut to crack and it ought to be looked at totally holistically agree. and not um, singled out like this. The reason why it was generally singled out because it was when we were modeling King Street, it was so integral to the way the queuing backed up into King Street. Yeah. Other intersections without the, on State Street did not exhibit that. And so that's kind of when the red flag threw up. Man, like, okay, we know this intersection has a problem. Yeah, other problems on, there are other problematic intersections on State Street. However, this one really affected the King Street corridor. And kind of that that's the culmination of, of how this right. really started. But what's the difference? I mean, if you don't have a light here, how does that impact your queuing? Um, King Street. 
I mean, is, is there a significant difference by putting that light there that impacts what you're doing on King? So because the way we're adding, <clears throat> we're going to be now promoting more traffic on King Street itself, because right now people are avoiding King Street. So now more people are going to be making these left turning volume, left turning movements onto Finn Street, causing an even worse delay at that one intersection. We weren't finding that that was happening at any other corridor area intersections or any other side area intersections at Summer at Summer Street. Um, we weren't finding any redistributing volumes causing issues. And this one we really found problems. I would appreciate having some of the um, information put online and I guess um, reiterating what Meg had said, if there are other public meetings or other opportunities or as you're progressing the design, please, um, I ask you to, to let our neighborhood know because this will have a pretty significant impact on our area. Thank you. Um, please. Well, uh, uh, Mim, I'm sorry, she's been waiting sorry. for a little. And let me just get a sense of who else I know you're anxious to ask. You're anxious, you're anxious. So I've got five people, and I don't want to lose track of anyone. So um, thank you. I've lived there for about 38 years. Okay. 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 With these, with this area, and it does seem from your design that uh, making the right turn lane from Finn onto King Street is going to help significantly, and also cr you know creating a safer pedestrian space. The problem that I have with what you've proposed for State and Finn uh, is that the street, the speed limit on that street. Do you know what it is on uh, Finn Street? On Finn Street, I believe the post is it posted at 30? No, it's 20. It's 20 miles. That's a look. Yeah, they, you can't it. find what it's there because there's no sign there. And for many years, I've advocated for a street sign because if you're coming down Prospect and you go into that corner, it says before you go into that corner, it's 20 miles per hour, not 20 miles per hour slowing for the curve. The speed limit is 20 miles per hour. The speed limit on Prospect Street between Elm Street and Finn is 20 miles per hour. If any police officers want to go up there and get it, make a lot of tickets, do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, and, and I find it just, I mean, if you want to find a dangerous intersection, go to Summer and Prospect, where I personally have witnessed at least a half a dozen accidents since I've lived there. And a lot of them serious, because people are speeding up Summer Street, mm -hmm. and people are blasting through the stop signs on Prospect Street. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I appreciate what's going on, but I personally, my personal experience is I don't see how this is going to fix one thing that's going to make more problems and it costs a lot of money. And what I would suggest is that we put speed limit signs on Finn Street, mm -hmm. that you maybe create a special pedestrian uh, area like they do in Amherst around, uh, around Amherst College, where it's raised, which would also mm -hmm. do traffic calming, yep. where pedestrians can on demand you know, press a button and get flashing lights and you would deal with the pedestrian problem. I have made it a point to drive through that intersection at the peak hours. as I work downtown. And I have to say, to say, well, we're going to cut that waiting time at State Street to half the time you're waiting. I go, really? Because that doesn't seem worth it to tear up that intersection and destroy the integrity of that neighborhood. This is just my opinion, obviously. Um, so I would ask that you m at least consider in the mix, could you do some traffic calming mm -hmm. on that intersection by one, enforcing the speed limit mm -hmm. on the street and putting and posting the speed limit, which would help, and maybe do a safer pedestrian crossing? Because I personally feel like it. I, I understand that the objective is to, you know, ease the traffic flow. But it seems to me by creating that extra right turn lane down at the bottom of Finn, you're going to accomplish a lot. <laughs> and by straightening out, I, I just see if it stays two lanes there, you know, which it will on Finn Street, I, don't, I, I just feel like this is overkill. Yeah. And, um, you know, the thought of a roundabout there, it makes me want to go 50. <laughs> so I'm just, I just want to say, if you could please, you know, maybe cons at least consider. No, you brought two very, two very good trap calling measures. Is uh, is police enforcement? That's that's and posting usually, the speed limit. Yeah. The posting of the speed limit, unfortunately, and this is as traffic engineer, one thing I hate is the state of Massachusetts does not allow you to, to post a speed limit without a speed study. 
That is a state law. But I'm pretty sure because when I've asked for it on Prospect Street, it was already there. Signs get knocked down and they don't get replaced. The speed limit on Finn is 20. The speed limit on Prospect Street is 20 between Finn and Elm. So if there okay. is a established speed limit on that yes. street as yes. 20, then certainly there's no study we need to do. This, this, the DPW or whoever right. um, can can certainly post signs. However, there's not an established speed limit. So if there are no signs and there's not a special speed regulation, which is a state law, yep. um, which we can certainly find that information out for you, and a speed study has to occur. Now, I'm not saying that that's what needs to happen. If there might be a, a regulated and established speed on Finn Street, and certainly we can post more signs. And, and certainly, you know, you bring up a lot of good points about traffic calming, the raised crosswalks, those are certainly um, excellent countermeasures uh, just to calm traffic and slow speeds down. Um, typically, we don't use raised crosswalks at, at an intersection. However, if there's, if there's a mid-block or, or a midway crossing, that is typically where we'd, we'd install uh, such devices. And yeah, I don't know if there's any constellation, but this is not a, a, a rip-up or a tearing up of this intersection. Um, literally, the roadway is not going to be touched at all. The only work is going to be off to the side of the street, so very limited destruction. To okay, this, I, to this I, region. So I just, if that is any I just don't, I just feel like, you know, I just mm -hmm. feel like once you do that big, once you put in that right turn lane, because I think that's what's causing, you know, the backup. But anyway, I just, I don't want to take the whole time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your comments. You bring that good point. This point of information, which Jim actually can speak to, which is we have a traffic calming process in this town. We have a manual, we have a process, mm -hmm. we have an application. We don't we might call on an outside consultant, but we have people who are very involved and knowledgeable, and a lot of thought and time and energy has gone into making that happen. And it makes me nervous to, to have people have to appeal to you to do something that, in fact, mm -hmm. there's been an application towards this stuff for years. Um, and there's lots of ways that the city has really intelligently dealt with traffic calming. So I'm wondering if, if folks know that, and you're going to push it again back to Mr. Nash, who's the chair of that committee. Right? Before we do that, yeah. Would those people who are already queued up and waiting to offer a question and comment, would you object to I I interrupting at this moment to ask this particular question? I just wanted to make the point of information. And just oh. there, he could do that when he wanted to. It, just, it's, it, it sounded as though people were not aware that we already have a very good process that people can take advantage of in this town that doesn't seem to be active enough in moving through to those processes. That's just point of sure. information. No, Thank you. you. Now, before I lose track, I know, sir, you had your hand up, and you had your hand up. Am I missing anyone else? Be and you did, sir. So why don't, in the back, and then you, and then you. I mean, I, is that okay? Do you object? <laughs> My name's Mark Mojo. I actually live up in Leeds. Uh, but I do come through this intersection quite a bit. And I am a culprit of the cut through, but not your street. I usually go up summer and down Prospect, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, and go to that intersection. So I don't want to bother your neighbor. <laughs> I understand <laughs> what that's all about. Um, but I think that, not that I'm for a light, actually, I came here originally to say it should be a four way stop. And I understand what you're getting at here with the light and stuff. But if there was a light there, or even a four way stop, I would tend to go to Fenn Street and take a left because that's usually my traffic pattern. Um, so it would alleviate, I think, a little bit of traffic going through your neighborhood, believe it or not. I, I didn't pull, you know, I'm not a big engineer person, but um, I, think, I think maybe it would work out to alleviate some traffic in that area. Um, but the other thing I'm looking at here is that there's an awful lot of lines painted on the roads on King Street. Um, and it's really concerning to me because we painted a lot of lines in the city of Northampton in general between bike lanes and everything else. And, and the new intersection that we have, the Amon Road going up Bridge Road, the little dots that go up the hill there, those are all gone. And it's a traffic concern, a very dangerous intersection now, I believe. Um, so. I think my, my main point here is just to make sure that if we do all this stuff, let's start to maintain the lines on our roads. Uh, I think they're in terrible shape. Uh, I see, sorry about the DPW, but I see us buying equipment, new trucks all the time. I'd rather put some of our DPW money into doing our roads more so. 
I see a lot of roads that are paved, that need paving. I, I just, I think in general, we need to start to maintain our roads more, and that includes the lines on the roads. Thank so that's it. Thank you for that comment. Thanks. Um, Ma'am? Hi, I'm Hetty Rose. I'm on uh, Round Hill Road. Uh, I want to do, thank the folks who made it possible to have this meeting, which I know took a lot of effort, uh, which was also the first time I heard anything about a traffic light. Um, I do want to thank you also for the good <coughs> overview and the history of that, and I'm well aware of the long time it takes to get some of this stuff through. I'm also aware of the fact that some of these things, like the highway guidelines or the laws about the, the uh, traffic signals or the mileage and so forth um, are sometimes very helpful and sometimes they're very destructive of what people who are actually living in an area are aware of and that is not addressed by some of those. So I would urge us to look for a way around those or to appeal or to create a, a special condition sure. or whatever. Um, I wanted to commend the last couple of people, uh, several people who basically have expressed what I wanted to say, so I don't think I'm going to take much more time. Um, I'm also concerned about the fact that you're talking about air quality, and it seems to me there's nothing worse than lines of cars in terms of air quality when you have another stoplight. And so the idea of two stoplights within one very short block seems on the face of it not to make any sense. But obviously you've given us lots of data and important reasons why it might make sense, but I do also agree that it is kind of overkill. Um, one of the other parts that I wanted to mention is, and it's actually highlighted by these uh, wonderful maps, is the fact that what we're doing with King Street, which is already this street with all these problems, we're suddenly broadening that out and creating another set of problems that we're now decorating with, mm -hmm. with street signs and with traffic signs, which in point of fact, I think, will cause a lot of backup. Now, I have used that shortcut to come down Prospect Street and down Bid Street uh, to go to King Street for probably 50 years. And I don't think I've ever been in the situation that was described by one of these backups where I've had to sit however many seconds or whatever it was, but maybe I was busy thinking about something so I, I didn't really clock it and I take your word for it. But I'm absolutely convinced that that's going to cause much more backup, much more backup than we've ever had there before. I think your single best improvement there is the right turn lane, because I can't tell you how many times I've come down there and then sat there totally incapable of doing anything because somebody is blocking my way to make the right on, on red. So I would support that one. I would support the greater emphasis on Sumner, which I think is the place where many of us have been close to accidents as people come shooting down that hill from Sumner. And the other part of traffic amelioration and, and safety and so forth that I would like to point to is the fact that the street juts out, there's a corner that juts out there on State Street, which, especially for people who don't know it, suddenly hits you in the face when you come down State Street. So talk about another obstacle on State Street. But anyway, I would certainly urge us to try to think about moving that whole elaborate system mm -hmm. to Sumner, which I think is an, a, an intersection that's fraught with many, many more dangers and would do much to ameliorate State Street rather than putting the state in fin. Uh, and as I said, the other thing is the whole, the whole uh, slice that I think is residential along the way is going to feel much more like being center city when you have a basic highway design light mm -hmm. in, within one half block, literally. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that's one of the goals that we really tried to, to minimize, is to make it not feel like a, like a signalized intersection. Like this, this, this intersection is not going to feel like King Street. You know, these large overhead structures, really wide curves. The curve line is going to stay, it's going to stay very compact and tight. And you bring up a lot of interesting points um, that, that's worth noting is, is Finn Street, right now, it, it's free flow traffic. So you don't have to stop at State Street if you're driving on Finn Street. So when we put a, a traffic signal there, inherently, you will now have to stop if you're on Finn Street. And so that's kind of what we were talking about before as, as part of no, but the, the what, queuing what with that. What is difficult to understand is what the rationale is for having people stop there and creating that uh, other air quality issue and the lights issue mm -hmm. and the backing up of traffic issue, that, which you now have stretching all the way up because you're going to have people backing up to, to So what, what the, the trade-off is, 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 is can we back up or can we, not back up, can we, can we cause some more delay to Finn Street but make State Street so much better? There's that, that constant trade-off that we're fighting. Because right now, Finn Street's great. There's no backups at all. You don't stop until you get to King Street. Um, you can drive on through the, in terms of air quality. That's all great. But State Street is just, you know, there's a lot of congestion. So that's kind of, when we look at level of service, that report card, the intersection itself gets the grade. We all, not just the approach or that one street. It's the whole intersection. So right now, the whole intersection uh, you don't actually even analyze Finn Street because it's a free flow condition. It gets a grade of A++++. So when we signalize it, we look at what is that intersection grade, and that grade is a B. And that's a significant improvement over the F that is currently on State Street. So we look at the approaches level of service as well. So it's, it's that constant trade-off of do we, take, do we make Finn Street a little bit worse to make State Street a lot better? And well, in this case, I think we were able to find that balance that we were able to do that. In a lot of situations, we're not able to do that, and that, that's what we would need more. And that's kind of that ratio, that signal warrant. Uh, I understand, and I understand that they're all trade-offs, and I would urge you mm -hmm. to think more in line with what was proposed before, which is an, a much larger overview of mm -hmm. the whole, uh, of what we're trying to do in what uh, is a yep. relatively small town to which people are very, very mm -hmm. devoted and they have to come here for a reason, and they don't want to see those reasons disappear. But one of the things that I was trying to point out is that I think that the Sumner area would do much more for improving State Street. Mm -hmm. And you could leave, and, and then adding those right turn lanes, both on State and on Finn. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, I'm sorry, yeah, on Finn going to King that would alleviate a lot of that concentration there because people will, well, half of those people on State Street will turn right there. Now, the other thing that wasn't always the way it is now, which is the one way of Sumner. We looked at the, so that's, we looked at Summer Street. That was certainly part of this study. Um, we looked at that with Wayne early on, uh, the planning director, and um, as, obviously, you know, we looked at North Street and King Street and Summer Street as that intersection. We looked at reversing the direction of Summer Street has significant benefits to the King Street corridor. However, we felt reversing the direction of the one way of Summer Street would have negative effects on the overall neighborhood in that region. Well, so that was certainly looked at. However, I still think that there's certainly safety measures and improvements that needs to be looked at at Summer and State Street. And, at, and we really appreciate you guys well, bringing that to our Yeah, attention. I was going to say this. The other part about Summer Street, I keep calling it Summer, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Summer Street is the fact that the, uh, that one, one part is two-way and one part is one-way. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that would make a difference as well. Just to clarify, uh, I don't know if I'm following. You mean so, the whole thing one-way? Once you cross over State Street. Way. Right, so it goes two-way. Two way. Two way. Right. Right. So are you suggesting make the whole, look at making Summer Street one-way the whole way? Up the hill. Up the hill? Um, well, I think that would alleviate some of what's going on. Uh, I don't know whether I would make it up the hill or down the hill, but... Yeah. No, certainly. I think extending the one way farther, I think that could have positive benefit. That's some, we, we looked at specifically Sumner between State and King Street. 
So what direction, you know, looking at that, making it bi-directional, making it direction in the other, going the other way, um, that's kind of like this, this project focus. But I think it's interesting, you know, making, if you take what's west of, you know, the other portion off the hill, that, that's an area, you know, I wonder what that, that certainly could have a, a positive effect. I think, you know, definitely look like at Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. Well, my name is Garrett Adams, and I live at 148 Crescent Street. That's cruel irony, because it was hard to wait tonight, but I'm really glad I did. That That's the one idea that I came here with, was consideration <laughs> of some one-way streets in the, in the greater neighborhood. And I really, I think you got great feedback tonight. Mm -hmm. yes, I hope you've taken a lot of notes. Mm -hmm. um, the knock-on effects, if that is, is that what it's called, the other intersections? Yep. I don't remember the terminology, but that Summer Street one is a big one. Yep. So living on Crescent Street, I ride my bike a lot, so I'm crossing on the bike trail since it has come to have that nice crossing up there. But I come home under the tunnel at Dunkin' Donuts, and then I negotiate my way the, you know, up the, up the hill. Um, and it, by when I go that direction on my bike and I'm coming down Crescent Street, down Summer Street, I know the difficulty of that intersection for pedestrians. And I think, wow, if I wasn't on my bike, I'd never get across here. Mm -hmm. And so my concise suggestion, because when you brought up the four-way stop model, I wanted to ask about the right turn of, of state to fin. Because so, you said that so was option, so option if I, if I can add right on. That's correct. If you would consider that option in conjunction with pedestrian bike safety mm -hmm. crossing measures at calming Finn yep. and State. So if you calm summer, the intersection of State Street in such a way that would make it more easier to cross for pedestrians and bikes and and cars mm -hmm. by the same token if you're going yep, straight sure. across it you don't have to dart mm -hmm. um and you calmed the pedestrian crossing two places on finn that that round you really need to call prospect coming into that curve mm -hmm. yeah. because yeah. if you narrow prospect before the curve that there's actually probably real estate for a small roundabout yeah. and if you went big picture and made summer street one way mm -hmm. that would be a way to distribute traffic in the town and people that are not going north of King are not going right to Amherst or whatever can get but that exact it, discussion that, was had and with planning and that was a, a nugget that just where we weren't going to tackle with that project with looking at you know that those intersections over there and reversing the traffic and the impact right. of that neighborhood. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big neighborhood. That's a big picture. So yeah. my, my ideas that I'm, I'm thinking of is really, really consider what another person said. I think that bike and pedestrian use has spiked. Okay. And I've, I, I came here in 2000 from Seattle. Mm -hmm. We moved to Seattle from Boston. Another, another person came up and said, you do, what do we need, lights at every intersection? When I moved to Seattle, I was like, they don't have lights anywhere, but it works. Right. Every intersection in Seattle is signed like degrees lower than other places and people interact as people and cross. And, the, and then the other person that said, when you build a light, it, people will avoid it. Yeah, I really think that that is kind of true to men, mentality wise. Mm -hmm. Once I go on my bike and I know the shortest routes to get somewhere, mm -hmm. It, we're spoiled by traffic in Northampton. As soon as you leave this town, if you cross the river or, or go anywhere, you realize, oh, waiting through two or three cycles of life to end the State Street to, to cross right. Main Street. That's, yeah. that's bad traffic. That's bad yeah. traffic. Yeah. So I agree with the comments of like a light is probably overkill. Mm -hmm. If you really, I appreciate your wanting to use the funds while you can. If the right turn lane would require that, mm -hmm. and in conjunction with all the, this feedback, be worth doing. Or if having the possibility of a flashing or signalized for pedestrians or whoever mm -hmm. is something, if I would, based on this feedback, make it provisional. Not we're not doing a light. We're we're making it so that we can cross whoever needs to cross here at some point.
Great to be back. And we did look, the right turn lane is something we certainly looked at. The biggest reason why it's not shown is, is primarily the right of way impacts is the taking of, of private property. Um, but I think you bring up some great suggestions. Uh, well, it, it, I think that the, that the calming effects will actually, be, you'll have better flow on State Street just with what you're doing on King Street. Right. And the calming effects will make it easier for everyone else. Thanks. Thank you. Reed Schimmelfing, 29 Aldrich Street. You're well represented tonight. <laughs> uh, you were a lot of good comments. I won't repeat those. Uh, my primary concern is Finn and State, and the jumping to the last step before really looking at the steps to, to address a needed intersection clearly. Um, one of the things that hasn't been talked about tonight is light pollution. Mm -hmm. I have bedrooms on the second floor, straight shot to those red light changing to green light, changing to yellow light. I as Meg, my next door neighbor, is going to see that, is going to hear the chirping bird, if there's a bird chirping. No chirp, I can promise you no chirping uh, But <laughs> either way, um, I, I don't want to see those lights flashing. I don't see a need for them today. Maybe 10, 20 years from now. We are looking at a bike share program that has just gotten started. We know people are coming down the bike path and down State Street, and it's, they're riding the bike instead of the car. We've got a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. We haven't looked at that. We haven't even talked about it. We just <coughs> talked about something, an idea that started in 2003, long ago. Um, people who are on the corner of State and Finn, and you didn't want to lose their front yards mm -hmm. with a roundabout, um, they're not sitting in their front yards. On that, at that corner. And they're not going to want to see the red light changing to the green light at 2 in the morning either. So if there's <coughs> taking us some space to make a little roundabout, take the trucks off of State Street completely. Why should there be through traffic of trucks allowed at all so we don't have to accommodate a truck taking the left turn at that corner? They should be on King Street. If they're a moving truck or a delivery truck, fine. But um, if there's one of those 40-foot trucks going down State Street, we, we've got a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. um, so you have at King and Finn a dedicated turn lane in both directions off of King <coughs> and Finn, either northbound or southbound. It's not going to back up King Street if people can't get on to Finn as fast as they want to if they have to wait a red light because Finn is backed up. So if there's a roundabout there or if there's a four-way stop there, it may slow some people down getting off of Finn, but uh, off, onto Finn, off of King, but it's not going to block up King Street. The other thing I think about as far as a four-way stop, which is a whole lot easier, you said, well, the traffic light, we don't need to have it forever. We get a traffic light in there. We're never going to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. We put a four-way stop in there, we can say, oh, it didn't work, we need to go for the traffic light. It's not going to go the other way, ever. We know that. Mm -hmm. Half a mile up the street, Prospect, Jackson Street, that was a problem intersection, cars backed mm -hmm. up. I don't think the state DOT was interested, mm -hmm. because it's not a numbered highway. Uh, there was a, well, let's try a four-way stop. It's not going to work, it's never going to work. Um, it worked great. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people on Prospect touch their brakes, which is good. <laughs> Instead of, you've got two schools, mm -hmm. you've got a park, you've got the YMCA, you've got the hospital employees, all passing through that intersection. Mm -hmm. And it is working a whole lot better than it did five years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's four signs no maintenance, mm -hmm. no cost. And People are, and the number of pedestrians that cross, I, I go through that intersection a lot, the number of pedestrians that cross is substantial, and the bike riders as well, coming from the schools, people stop. There's a pedestrian, they sit, they wait, and maybe somebody else on the other side who isn't affected by the pedestrian can go through, even if it wasn't their turn, because the person who would have had the turn had to wait for the, for the pedestrian. It works. 
I can't imagine how we've jumped to a traffic light when we haven't really looked at other things that may very well work. No, thank, thanks for your comment. And, you know, in terms of, you know, jumping to the traffic signal conclusion, just to be clear that, you know, we court, we study, we are, we are at a point right now where, you know, we want to do something to improve that intersection, regardless Absolutely. of what, if it's a stop, if it's a roundabout, um, in terms of, now, and it's not too late to try some of these, these low cost um, tests, so to speak. Um, now, when we're talking about public roadways, we, we still need to be very careful. We can't just throw up stop signs uh, liberally. So, not saying that it's that it's expensive to, to make sure that we you know we can try this. And I, and I think that's a great suggestion of, of maybe we should just study what would have, what would a four way stop. Is it safe to implement a four way stop at that location? Let's try it out. Even if it's really bad, at least to say hey hey maybe we, at least we tried it. And, and maybe, maybe it will work. Like you said, you gave a good example of Upper Jackson Street. Um, and I, I think that's definitely a, a great, great feedback that we should look at. Um, and it's certainly not too late to do something like that. But just to be clear, liberally putting up stop signs, we, it's not as simple as you know, we can't just throw up stop sign. We have to look at it, but right. certainly something that is feasible and that we can do prior to, to jumping into signal conclusion. So appreciate that. And certainly uh, I think that's something we should look at. Thank you all for doing this. Is there anyone else with any questions or comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Lori Fenlis and I live at 15 Oliver Street. I have just a very simple question. What listserv should I have been on or what mailing list to learn about the process before this moment? When would I have heard about the September 25th thing or how do I learn about this? How do I stay on top of this? I can answer that. Okay. So um, part of the reason that I've been involved in this process has been that the, the city has a history of when these sorts of projects come forward from Mass DOT that we, we, we do ter a terrific job of outreach around all sorts of uh, projects that come out of our planning processes. People know about those meetings, but there tends to be a disconnect. And that's why my, uh, when Meg called me on the Friday night, two days later, and she was like, how did this happen? And um, that, you know, that I can share that, you know, there was the, the roundabout, uh, there's the discussion for exit 19, which I only learned about when I was actually sitting in another public meeting that it was somewhere else. And so that what you're seeing here is a, is a response to that, that, um, that there's, there's an acknowledgement that we could have done a better job at doing that piece of outreach. And that, but MassDOT adhered to their process, which is to put a pub, public notice in the paper. And so they, they did their piece, and then they arranged with us to have this you know this room and that some of some of us counselors you know were just a little bit uh, more in the know about what was going on and so there was a mismatch in, in the constituents who knew about that 25 percent meeting um that and and i'll be frank with you that i was in the meeting where director lascalia shared that that meeting was going on i was chairing the meeting it went right over my head and that it wasn't until uh, Councillor Sherris shared it again during council meeting, and I was like, oh yeah, I have to let my constituents know. But for a lot of counselors, and, and for a lot of us, that people need to hear about three things three times before it really locks in. And for a lot of people, it only happened once, if at all. And so the reason we're here tonight, you know, that I was pushing for this, is because, you know, I, you know, we may not agree on things, but people need to know about stuff that's important to them, and that, um, that that's what Councillor Carney and I worked on to have, you know, to have tonight, so people can get the information. You can ask the hard questions, and it's good that we're, we're you know, that 
you know, we're going to get some more answers. I, you know, the, the night of that meeting, there were not a lot of hard questions about that intersection because most of you weren't here. Right. And that, but you're here tonight and you've asked some really great, great questions and I think we're going to get some answers. Okay, and thank so, you. I just have one other comment. Uh, a four-way stop sounds, um, you know, less intrusive, yes, less sure. logical there, but it does mean that every single time somebody has to stop, whereas with a light signalizing time, sometimes you're going to go straight through, right? And so it's That's always correct, yeah. that that uh, I'm not advocating either one, but there, but it's, it seems like a, a more uh, benign intervention. Um, but it does mean that every single time you have to come to a full stop. That and that's one of the trade-offs, and right. we, we consider all of that. And that's typically when when you 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 start looking at analyzing these intersections, four-way stops end up being ruled out just because it creates more of a more of a problem than what already is. When four-way stops become a solution, we have lower volumes in the really bad accident concerns because you're forcing people to stop and wait their turn to go. When you have these high volumes, four-way stops typically are not the answer. I'm not saying that, that it can't be yeah. the answer here, um, but right. that, that is correct. I just wanted to understand oh that it's, it, it sounds, you know, a lesser impact, but in fact it has unintended consequences too. That is, so. that is correct. Thank you. And just to address, someone else mentioned light pollution. Um, that is certainly something that we think about when it comes to implementing these signals, and um, we are sensitive to that, and that's kind of what goes into, there, there are measures we can do to try to reduce that based on the type of housings that are around these signals, so you can only view the traffic signal, you can only see the light from a certain angle, so, <clears throat> so that was a good comment. I don't remember what person said that, but that was, I uh, appreciate that, and certainly, I, we weren't aware of that before, and now that some there there are measures we can do to reduce that if if the signal is what ends up happening here. So I, I appreciate that feedback. Can I just add to that last comment of the reminder that you, I think you said there were no studies of pedestrian and bike crossings of Finn Street or pedestrian and bike crossings of State Street, so that A plus flow on King Street is not a plus if you're trying to cross at the corner of where Prospect is or if you come down from the bike trail from Stop. That's shop. correct. That is and correct. by the same token, if you're coming down Summer Street and you're waiting to cross in any vehicle, mm -hmm. that people are going fast and then all maybe backing up, maybe not. Mm -hmm. None of that is being taken into consideration in terms of the, the impact of this. And so I like what I've heard tonight, that ties a lot of pieces that like mm -hmm. improving flow on state and maybe moderating flow somehow on Finn while maintaining it. Mm -hmm. But light might not be the way to do it. The that four way stop might not be correct. the way to do it. I don't know. <laughs> right. But that I just want to point out those those were not part of the study or the data either mm -hmm. one. And I think with this bike as as a biker ever since I've lived here now eighteen years, the number of people biking now is a lot. When you're on any of these bike trails, they, you know, or even when you're just, I mean, I'm sure if you live right by this intersection and you've seen the increase the way that I have being, you know, bike, bike commuting regularly. I mean, the idea is that we get even more cyclists and which will inherently promote better accommodations for cyclists yeah. and less people relying on, on vehicles. That's kind of the, the goal of, of all of these projects. And if you look at the King Street design itself, um, that's that's what we're doing. We're actually adding a separate, a grade separated bike lane um, along King Street um, to promote safer cyclists, uh, cycle traffic along the King Street corridor. Lori, did you have another question? No. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'll just uh, address the the comment you were saying. What what should you be subscribing mm. to? Yeah. To, to be notified of these projects. DPW every Friday puts out an update of every project that we are involved in. And we put it out on our website and it is cross-posted by the city of Northampton's Facebook page. 
And so there is a list of where we've been, what we've been doing, what projects we're working on, what stage they're in. Um, and if there are questions around that, you're free to contact our office. And, and does that include public hearings around it? It does. Okay, great. Which Thank I just said, which in the state, in the, like, would it say King Street Improvement? It would not. It would have said King Street Corridor Improvements, 25% design hearing. And anything on the web had only King Street up until that point. Yeah. So we would never have known. No. So we get it. Pushed it. And that's I'm why we're here tonight. <laughs> well, and I just, and, and just, just to I guess, go back to the original comment, I recognize that Master OT's comment period is over, but because the outreach was not there and we all had no idea right. that this was being included in this. I hope that the meeting notes from this meeting mm -hmm. make it to Mass Dog. Yeah. Can we be assured of that? No. Uh, the official comment period is over. That's, that is this, and I want to be very clear and it's very important, I've been clear with the counselors that this is in no way a substitute for or, or a do-over of the 25% design hearing, public design hearing, it would actually be a violation of the law. But I recognize that, and this is a mass dot funded project, it's still a city project. So I think we want to make sure our voices are still being heard through this process on this specific project. We understand that, that there is legality associated with this process and the official comment period is over and that's not something the city could control. If we could have a copy of the notes, <laughs> I'd be perfectly happy to send it to the state engineer. Can we do that? Just you are welcome to send the, the state engineer any documentation that you want to send. Could we have a copy of the notes from tonight so that we could do that? When, they're, when, they're, Laura, when Laura has finished doing these, uh, we'll make these available um, as you know, a, a public document. It's minutes from a, a you know a public meeting, and mm -hmm. the NCTV also keeps. Rec or this entire meeting was recorded audio visual. That will also be the, the camera's right there, Lori, right in front Got of you. It. Yeah. So that's all. That all will be made available. Just, the minutes from this, everyone's names, questions, comments, to the best extent. Where would we go to look for the minutes, though? Where will we put those, Laura? Well, normally for um, public meetings, they are posted yeah. to the website. It, since it's not officially a meeting of a public body per se, I'm not quite right. Because sure typically, about. typically all of the city, you know, whether it's planning board or conservation commission or whatever, they all have their own agenda and minutes stored. But I think that there can be special meeting category. Well, it is now posted yeah, as a um, city council city meeting. Council meeting. Um, so I guess it could just be posted to the website uh, adjacent to the agenda that's currently posted. So okay. Yeah, it's already right. Where, where it shows the agenda, I mean, because you can find this meeting that's happening right now on the city's website under agenda. Under city council. Under yeah. city council, under the calendar. It'll still exist there with the agenda, and then when the minutes are completed, those could also be a PDF that you'd be able to link to and download. Thank you so much for taking the notes. Oh. I have a question. Now. The 25% here, I need to do the public notice, but can the city add on to that? Could we always make a policy that we're going to do more notification? Yeah, I mean, again, that's uh, the DPW. Uh, that's a comment that you would give to the mayor who. I actually requested that the only public information we have from people is everybody's phone number through the reverse 911. Right? You get those calls to move your car, you know, if it's snowing. But that's absolutely, we're not going to be able to use that to call everyone and say there's an important meeting, you know, 25% hearing. And that's because there isn't, for many people, there are different important meetings every day. And then if people were getting a phone call every day about a meeting in Florence or a meeting in Leeds or a meeting in downtown or related to whichever concern might be, you know, more important to some people than others, they would unsubscribe from that reverse 911, which would defeat the purpose of having people um, be able to be notified for an emergency. So otherwise, unless you've shared your email information with someone or subscribe, it would require you to look, unfortunately, every day on the calendar and see 
what's projected or what's happening. Yeah, you know, I guess I would just recommend if you have another project similar to mm -hmm. like this, where there's the main component and then a side component, you also identify the full component so that the abutters um, to the entire project are aware. Because people who actually were going to have um, land issues being taken for the right turns and all that, I think were notified. So they were probably the ones who came to the 25% meeting. Do you know about that? I don't know about the notification to uh, abutters to the intersection. Was there an official the notification? Right -of -way Typically, the right of way process for the Mass DOT does not notify the abutters until that right of way process is not started until after the 25% public because 25% is still considered preliminary design, so nothing is set in stone. Sometimes the Mass DOT will reach out. I can't speak on behalf of the Mass DOT. I think um, the people who were, gonna, who, who were potentially going to have land taken for the project were made aware. That, that, that's very possible. Yeah. Um, that, that is entirely possible. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, the city, the city does not do outreach. I think what Tracy was just saying, uh, the, it's called a King Street Carter thing. If I have business on King Street, I'll go to the meeting. Yeah, if NASDAQ, if NASDAQ had actually listed it that way in their notification, then everybody would, I mean, again, I didn't even know myself that that change was part of the King Street improvements. So, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's unfortunate that MassDOT did not list that as the... But, but I guess it's just, it's MassDOT, but it's also the city, and we have to just make sure that there's that interface that's happening to make sure that the city is represented. Public outreach is a, is a huge challenge in, in every community, and it's something I think as the city and, and as consultants, we're, we're, we're always trying to get better at. And certainly, I think there's, there's a lot of room for improvement, not only for this project, but for others moving forward. And, and, I, and I think that's, this isn't the only time where on a massive project will be, this isn't a feedback, so. I, I, I understand. I, totally hear I, I think we all just want to make sure that we're informed as this project moves through the next phases mm -hmm. that we know what those next phases are and where our opportunities mm -hmm. are to voice our opinions during the time frame that it still will be accepted by Mass DOT. Could we do a list, sir? That's what, what about the Google group? Okay, so the Google group there is a for Ward One, which includes, of course, a broad spectrum of Ward One going on, you know, Jackson Street School and up Bridge Road. Up, I mean, those people that started that Google group actually started that about nine, ten years ago when they started to form a Ward One association. And you know, I'm not going to get into details about that, but it, it, they there was never follow through, and there was a a, a requirement that it be resident-led and not counselor-led. I have continued to have that list, that list. So you know, well, I will use that when I have the opportunity. In this case here, I was in the hospital and wasn't able to. I myself. was on board one. I've never heard of this. Yeah. yeah, because you probably weren't there in 2009 when those people who I bought my house in 06. Pardon me? I bought my house in 06. Okay, so when there was a notice, uh, I went around and, uh, uh, you know, flyered as much as I could when there were some folks who wanted to form an association in 2009, and that, you know, happened again. Um, you know, uh, what can I say? I mean, again, what it, those people, those residents who wanted to start a Ward 1 association kind of fell off the map. I mean, I would happily welcome anyone who wants to start. It was made clear to me at the time that this was a resident-led initiative and that they would welcome city councilor input and in coming in and reporting, which I, you know, I've tried to do, but I'm certainly would happy to, to join in with anyone who wants to do you know who's that? in charge of the list so the people could get added to it? Mm. I mean, I'm on it. Didn't that start because of the fires in Northampton, the arson? Yeah. I think and we had Ward 3 existed and we all got excited. Ward 1 should have the same thing. There yeah. was a meeting, two meetings. It all fizzled. It all fizzled. Do you know who's in charge of the list so the people Nobody's could get added in charge, to it? but I have, well, I actually have access to all of the people who signed up at the time. And uh, as much as I could, I sent out invitations to people I had you know, who, who I had an email information for, and then over the years, people who've posted things on there have asked me to um, add them to the list, for example, but it hasn't been used by residents. 
especially. Yep. So that's a different conversation. Maybe it's something we need to have with the city council, but it would seem like a really good idea for city councilors to have a volunteer list of people who want to be contacted about things that happen in their district, mm -hmm. which we could get, have a sign-up table at voting days, you know, in the ward where people come in to vote, they could say they want to be on the list or they don't want to be on the list and put their email in. And it's that simple. And then counselors would then have to make people aware of when issues came up. But it seems to me that is actually a big job on the part of counselors. If you're going to represent us, we need to know, have our input on what you're representing us about. So maybe it's another conversation um, and we can explore having that be a citywide process. If it's not in place already, it should be. Yeah, it's not something I know of in place, but I would welcome that. Any, yeah, anybody who wants to move forward with that would be a, certainly a help to be able to better circulate information. Because again, email email contact is not public information. I can only get it when it's offered right. to me. So I want to you know speak on behalf of all of us to say thank you so much, all of you, for coming tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I know how hard you two worked in order to put that together. Um, people putting in extra time and hours, the great explanations that we got from folks. Um, and our walk away is that we, we do want to continue to have our voices heard around this particular issue. So we're hoping that that decision, I know there's one member of the decision making process, Mr. Fyden, who is not with us tonight, who is a historical part of, I think, having consultants come in about the light, all, other pieces we don't really have in place. So that's one voice we haven't heard from, and it would be very helpful for him probably to have a copy of our notes as well. And if he would like to add anything, perhaps to tell um, Mr. Nash or Maureen. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Is there a 50% planning meeting public <laughs> plan? <laughs> there is not. There are no, there is, there are no more plans. There are no more plans. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>